for the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife Committee. And uh, before we begin, I want to introduce uh, in her first official hearing our new consultant for the committee, Tina Cannon Leahy. So welcome, Tina. Uh, today's hearing focuses on the Department of Fish and Game. And uh, by way of introduction and context, I think we all understand that California's wildlife diversity uh, is an unparalleled asset in the nation, if not the world uh, for California. We have more endemic species and habitat types than any other state. We also have the highest number of endangered species in America. And we are, of course, the most populous state in the nation. So we have a lot to treasure, and we also have a lot at risk. As one of several very serious examples, our iconic salmon populations are in a crisis with uh, a quarter billion dollar commercial fishing industry closed for two years in a row and quite possibly uh, a third closure coming again this year. The Department of Fish and Game uh, is the public trustee for California's fish and wildlife resources and the habitats upon which they depend. So it has one of the most critical roles of any state department. The extent to which fish and game is successful in fulfilling its mission is crucial to preserving our biodiversity, the health of the ecosystems that we all depend on, our quality of life as Californians, and the substantial economic and cultural values that we derive from a healthy environment. It's a huge job, and it's getting bigger. It's been getting bigger in recent years. As our population and uh, the associated development that goes with that population grows, user conflicts increase, there are more threats and pressures on our wildlife and habitats, and there are new and emerging challenges like climate change that have added complexity to, uh, to the challenge of natural resource conservation and management. And even as these challenges have grown, we've continued to ask the Department of Fish and Game to do more and more in recent years. Its mission and responsibilities have increased dramatically. The department has grown from what was traditionally a hook and bullet agency with responsibility for hunting and fishing to an agency that now has very broad conservation responsibilities as the public trust steward for all of California's wildlife and ecosystems, while still continuing to have responsibility for hunting and fishing. So in light of the breadth and importance of this mission that we've given the Department of Fish and Game, I think it's important that we take stock from time to time to ask two questions that we rarely ask uh, here in the legislature. First, how are we doing in fulfilling this agency's mission and various mandates? That includes what's working well and where are we falling short? And second, how can we do better? Are we adequately supporting the department with financial resources? Are they efficiently using those resources? Is the department structured in a way that allows it to be effective and efficient? Or are there structural, structural or organizational problems that are standing in the way of meeting the Department of Fish and Game's mission? Are there benchmarks, including models from other states, that we can look to in answering these questions? Do the experience of other states point to changes that we should make here in California? Those are the questions that we're going to be asking here today. And if it sounds a little bit familiar to you, perhaps it's because the basic approach to oversight and accountability that we are using today is the essence of performance-based budgeting. It's something that the legislature is actively considering as part of a package of reforms that could include a much greater emphasis on legislative oversight in committees like this, as well as multi-year budgeting. But rather than wait and see uh, how much of that reform package moves forward this year, we thought we would go ahead and dive in and try to apply it to the Department of Fish and Game uh, right now. Uh, before going further, I do want to emphasize something very important, that we are not here to reconsider the Department of Fish and Game's mission or question the many laws and regulations that comprise that mission. We're here to ask how we're doing in meeting the mission and whether we can do better. That's what performance-based budgeting is all about, and that's the framework around which we have structured the agenda for the hearing today. The intent, and I want to emphasize this, is to look constructively and collaboratively at how we can maximize the effectiveness of this important state agency. I'm not here to beat the department over the head or to engage in a blame game. Quite the opposite. I personally am very impressed by the many dedicated people that work for the Department of Fish and Game. These are people who are deeply committed to the department's mission, who perform great work despite being underpaid and overtasked, despite the stress and pressure of furloughs, constant fiscal constraints, and almost equally constant political pressures because of the way the department is structured and operated. 
We will explore some of the Department of Fish and Game's shortcomings today. That, too, is part of performance-based budgeting. But we'll do it in the spirit of making the department what I hope will be nothing less than the best fish and wildlife agency in the United States, bar none. So given our focus today, we're very fortunate to have my colleague Ira Ruskin joining us. He chairs Budget Subcommittee 3, which has budget oversight over the department. And I believe Ira shares my interest in applying the principles of performance-based budgeting to the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, we cannot ignore the role that fiscal constraints have played in the department's ability to carry out its mission, for sure. There's been a history of unfunded mandates for which the legislature itself bears some responsibility. But we also know that fiscal constraints are not the only problem. And during tough economic times, we need to be creative and innovative in determining how we can accomplish our mission in this era of fiscal constraints. So with that, I want to invite my colleague uh, Ira Ruskin to make any opening comments that he might have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome. Uh, I uh, share the Chair's remarks about uh, uh, the range of things that uh, he addressed, uh, the overriding importance of the Department uh, to our State and the people of our State, as well as uh, a belief in the uh, efficacy of performance-based uh, 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 evaluation. It's something that uh, I saw work effectively in local government. I realize that the size of state government uh, is enormous in comparison to local government, but the principles, uh, I think, uh, can apply well. Uh, the department has a task, a set of tasks, and an overall responsibility that are of enormous importance to the people of our state, given the importance that the people place on environmental protection. And uh, I look upon it, as I think the Chair has stated he does, as a mutual responsibility. We share the responsibility, the Department and the Legislature, for carrying out those tasks, and we have to work together to do that. Uh, I want to uh, tell you uh, that uh, as Chair of Budget Sub 3, I'm very pleased uh, with the work that we've done together over the last few years to significantly increase the transparency mm -hmm. of uh, how funds are spent and where they're spent. And I thank you for that. Uh, I think that we need to increase that work, increase the transparency, and concomitantly increase the accountability of the department and the legislature for the goals uh, of the department. Uh, with that in mind, as uh, Chair Huffman said, I think it's really important that we work together to establish real and credible benchmarks for the work of the department so that we can sit down together and evaluate the work. And uh, I think we should also be open to, uh, in that same spirit, uh, to prioritizing the work of the department. Ask what are the most significant priorities so that our benchmarking and our systems of accountability and performance-based evaluation can really have efficacy. And with that, I uh, thank the Chair uh, for holding the hearing and uh, beginning on this effort, and it's a pleasure to join you in it. Thank you, Chair Ruskin. Ms. Yamada, did you want to make any opening comments? No, I will defer. I'm looking forward to hearing the witnesses. Thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Well, we have got a lot of ground to cover today. We're going to be here most of the day probably why the legislature does so little oversight, because it takes a lot of time. Uh, but we have a terrific uh, lineup of witnesses and panels. Uh, so let's, let's dive into the first panel, which is going to explore uh, the broad and evolving mission that we have given to the Department of Fish and Game. And instead of introducing the uh, various witnesses, I'm going to ask you to uh, sort of do a self-introduction as, as part of your remarks. So um, with that, I think we're going to begin with uh, Catherine Freeman from the LAO. And uh, has she been hanging on for all of the time? Yeah, the, the, the LAO is uh, kind of a special witness for us today because they have, uh, uh, as, as we like for them to do, they have uh, important opinions on almost everything we're going to be asking. So we're going to ask Catherine to hang around as part of every panel. Uh, and she has a written presentation that are part of our materials. And she will go to the appropriate part of a written presentation uh, that pertains to that particular panel. So good morning, Catherine. 
We will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Catherine Freeman. I'm with the Legislative Analyst Office, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Mark Newton. Uh, and we are here. We will be available for most of the day. We do have to duck out for one budget hearing, but um, we will try to stay as much as we can. Um, what I'd like to do today is give you uh, just a general overview and give you some questions um, that you may want to consider for the department. And I'll go through some of the budget issues because that's part of our program expertise, but I'm not going to go into a, um, a great deal of detail into what every single um, piece of their budget is. But what I'd like to do is um, follow with a theme that um, Mr. Huffman started, which is that the department has a very broad mandate. And within that broad mandate, its activities are also quite broad. And so we'd like to go over what those um, activities are and how the department is handling itself when it um, uh, does its mandates. So you do have a handout, and I will be following the handout. Um, I'll start with the, the overview of programs, move into funding, and then um, address some issues for legislative consideration. We also will go over a few of the recommendations that the LAO has, but again, that's not the focus of the, the hearing, so we won't um, go into great detail. So on, um, on page two of your handout, we looked at the department's mission, which Mr. Huffman um, addressed. It, it is quite broad. And it, it did start out as um, the department that was to provide the public enjoyment and also ecological values associated with fish and wildlife. Uh, they have seven major programs, include, and we include the de um, department's, um, uh, the Fish and Game Commission among those programs. The largest of the programs is the biodiversity um, conservation program, and that's what we traditionally think of as how to conserve habitat, how to look at the broader picture of what, what kind of species we want in the state, and how to keep them in the state if we wish to. Uh, the hunting, fishing, and public use is the more traditional fish and game, um, the bagging, the catches, how many, uh, how many can you catch, how many can you hunt. Um, what does it take to create a sustainable population for the hunting and fishing community? Uh, management of de the department's public lands, we're going to talk about that as one of the issues uh, that's come up. The department is charged with managing public lands that are both given to the state and purchased for the state um, through bond funds and through general fund, uh, mainly through its uh, sister agency, the Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, enforcement, which um, I will go into less detail because I know you'll have the game wardens here to talk about, but I, I'd like to talk just briefly about what their mandate is. It's not just to enforce the, uh, the department's goals, the department's rules, and the Fish and Game Commission's regulations and legislature's laws. They also are uh, pu regular public law enforcement officials when they're out doing their job, um, as they've discussed with me. So that is something that may be considered um, among the, the uh, discussion today is what is the role of the game wardens and how, how far can you extend their work. Um, we also, there's a communications and education piece. I think folks are fairly familiar with the, the department's education and outreach programs. And then uh, there's a spill response and prevention um, uh, pr program, generally called OSPR because it focuses on oil spills. <coughs> and what I'd like to say about that one is that it's not just in the marine environment, but also inland as well. And so the F Department of Fish and Game is, is a first responder. It's a coordinator, uh, and it's among the team that um, responds when there's an oil spill or, um, or otherwise. And then, as I mentioned, the Fish and Game Commission, which sets the regulations for uh, the department. Among all of these programs, and within and scattered between those programs, are the department's activities related to regulatory, um, regulatory components. Mainly, when one thinks about the regulatory component, we think about CEQA. So are folks, uh, are, are they within the compliance of the California um, Environmental Quality Act? Uh, the department's role with that is quite broad. Uh, they are a trustee agency for um, the state. They also can be a lead agency in um, projects and um, uh, within the uh, conservation, protection and, um, of wildlife and, and native species. The department also has six other mandates that, it, that we've selected for you to look at for um, regulatory components. They range from the federal uh, energy licensing for hydropower, uh, lake and stream bed alteration, invasive species, marine fisheries management, and that's something that we're going to go into a bit more detail later. 
um, natural community conservation planning process, which is a voluntary process that does lead to um, an, uh, a permitting for folks to both develop land as well as um, con conserve land in certain uh, regional areas, and then also timber harvest plans. And the department has a, a key role as both the trustee agency and as a permit reviewer for the um, for logging and for other timber harvest, both on state lands and on public lands. So turning to the funding overview, what we're gonna do is just look at the budget in three ways. We're gonna look at a 15 year uh, overview of the department's budget by percentage. So what, how much did each component take up in real dollars? And we didn't adjust anything, we just did real dollars over a 15 year period and then also we'll look at the proposed budget by percentage and, and activity. Um, the first uh, graphic that we give you is on page four. And what I'd like to focus on is this sort of middle area of the general fund, which is, has really not, um, it's been growing slightly from uh, 15 years ago, 1994-95 through 2010-11. And there is an anomaly year, but since we were going by fours, we had to keep it in. 2006-07, uh, we'll talk about this in the issues. Um, the department had to make some adjustments to its budget to um, handle some issues with uh, permit um, fee-based funding and a few structural deficits. But what you can see here is the variability of funding. We have bond funds jumping in in 2006-07 that take up a greater portion of the budget and then special funds which aside from that one year are relatively declining as a support um, for the department. So too federal funds and reimbursements which is that top line have been uh, variable and somewhat growing um, in terms of the activities that the department is looking at. Well, th this is also, these are also percentages of their budget, right? This percentages. So this correct. doesn't necessarily tell us dollar amounts. Right, and we'll get any to the, given year. Yeah. We're going to get to the dollar amounts. I would note that the reimbursements have changed in terms of the department's role as a Delta agency. So as other agencies are looking for the department to work in permitting and for the uh, BDC, BC <laughs> I'm always doing it wrong. <laughs> BDCP process, Bay Delta Conservation Plan, I should have just said it first. Um, they, uh, they're having to take, uh, they take money from other agencies to do their work and that's primarily from the Department of Water Resources and other agencies. So turning to page five, let's take a look at the, the budget in real dollars. So as you can see, it's pretty clear that the department's budget is growing and it's not growing by one component or another. Each component has been growing uh, in, in a different way. As you can see in 2006-07, we had a, a bump in um, bond funds. That happens periodically in the department. Um, obviously, we're missing years, so you may see it in other years as well. Uh, federal funds and reimbursements, as I mentioned, have bumped up a little bit, and they vary depending on what the department's activities are. But the real picture we want to look at is the picture of special funds and general fund. In terms of dollars, general fund has gone up over a period of time. And again, in 2006-07, there was the structural deficit where the general fund had to backfill fee-funded programs. And that in itself is, is pretty much an anomaly. So if you hold that, um, that year constant, you can see that the general fund has been increasing and special funds have also been increasing proportionally. Um, one of the hardest things I think a department has to deal with is when bond funding comes in, jumps in as a program funding source, and then pops out again. And I think the Department of Fish and Game as well as other resources agency um, programs have had a hard time with how to incorporate the bond funding for capital projects or for short-term projects and then really to let it go and go back to their core mission. So. That's just an area just to consider. It's not something that we've raised as an issue, but it's just a, it's a general um, difficulty for some departments. Then turning to page six, um, we're not gonna go into detail in the proposed budget. But what we wanted to do is give you an idea of well, how much money are we talking about. So the department's budget is about $385 million, and that's really support, not for capital outlay. 
Uh, most of the funding is for species management, permitting. You can see that the biodiversity program, that very broad mandate, is about, is almost 40% of the department's budget, whereas enforcement's 20%. The management of public lands is about 15 percent, <coughs> and hunting and fishing is about 20 percent. So in terms of how an oversight hearing might, might go, you may want to look at, well, are those percentages what, what you think the priorities should be for the department? And it's not easy to just change the percentages, but within those programs, there are ways to change the mandates. And also, we wanted to mention that about $45 million of the department's budget, or 12%, is for distributed administration. <coughs> That's throughout all of these programs, and we didn't break it out because we thought we, you should just see the total picture. So now that you know where the money goes, we were, we're going to sort of stop for a minute and say, okay, well, what are other states doing? Uh, we haven't identified necessarily a funding problem with the Department of Fish and Game, but there are other ways to fund your fish and game um, programs, the department itself. And so we took a look at other states' funding, and this is really just one organization's work looking at other funding, and it looks outside of the beneficiary pays concept, and it looks at taxes. It is, um, it was, when we looked at it, we looked for where were other depart or other states raising enough money to fund their entire program or a good significant portion of their program. And so there were various general sales taxes, dedicated sales taxes on outdoor gear, which may sort of border on um, beneficiary pays. There was a real estate transfer tax, and then also a dedication of lottery funds. In each case, there were positives and negatives associated with the, the funding source. In terms of taxes, the, the constant reminder was that if you do impose a tax on anything, including a sales tax, they can be diverted for other legislative purposes. And there was some frustration in some of the states where they had set up a tax, it, had, it had, was a dedicated funding source for their hunting and fishing programs, and it got diverted. And so no, no funding mechanism is perfect, but these are some ideas should the department wish to, or should the legislature wish to shift around how the department's funding is working? So with that general overview. Excuse me, Mr. Herman, may I ask one quick question? Mm -hmm. uh, may I just interrupt and, and say that currently the hunting and fishing licenses and so forth, all those funds enter to the department, is that not correct? So That's correct. So that is the principal. Special fund. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Those are, those are going in as special funds, and in fact, we will talk about how those, um, how, if there's any problems with that. Mm -hmm. um, so turning to some issues for legislative consideration, and again, we, we can be here for most of the day. Um, if I can't answer a question, then I'll find a way to answer thank it. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, the big question for an oversight hearing from a funding pers perspective is, does the funding structure and the priorities match up? And the department has a number of special special funds, so fees, hunting and fishing licenses. Uh, they have bond funds that are very restrictive and narrowly prescribed. And I think the one that we use, and this is not to call this one out as, a, as an example of good or bad management, it is the sea urchin fund. So we have f funds coming in to help sea urchins. Well, is that how we want to, do we want to just take that money and only help the sea urchins or do we want to help tidal areas or estuaries or wetlands? And so the question is, can the department take that money in and redistribute it out effectively? Yeah. Um, in the past, the department has had some fiscal management issues where it inappropriately shifted funding from special funds that were narrowly prescribed for other department priorities. That fiscal problem, as we saw in the 2006-07 budget year, was largely fixed by a backfill of general fund. At this point in time, the department has really begun to address those um, fiscal management issues. They're doing a good job. They're attempting to make any changes that the legislature has requested. Um, but the, que the, the overall, the broad question is, can, is the funding mix appropriate? Does it meet the statutory requirements? Can the department do its job? And are there other funding mechanisms, such as those other state funding mm -hmm. mechanisms, 
that would help the department in its in doing its job and fulfilling its mandates. <coughs> Great. Uh, yeah, jo uh, were, were you finished, Catherine? No, I can go through. I was going to go through the, the issues and then be available. I, I think if it's okay with the committee members, what I'd like to do is let the panelists testify. We're, I think the other, the LAO, we're giving a lot more latitude because they're covering uh, a lot of ground. But I think uh, we'll have some pretty concise testimony from the panelists and then just open it up to questions from the committee members. Is that all right with folks? So if you can hold on, Joel. Uh, uh, Catherine is going to hang around and will be available as part of this panel. Yeah. So th the second question I brought up, and that was land acquisition. We've had a lot of bond funds in the um, in recent years where we've given the Wildlife Conservation Board and other agencies funding to purchase land for the state. The management of those lands, in part, is falls on the Department of Fish and Game. And as we add land to our portfolio, we have not necessarily added personnel to staff those lands and to make sure that they're safe for whoever is using them. Um, the question is, does the department have adequate staff? And that, that really is a question for the department. And if they don't have adequate staff, what then should be done? There are two ways to go. One is to change the funding source. The other is to change how much land we're acquiring. And that both of those are difficult decisions, I think, for folks to consider. On page nine of the um, handout, we look at the uh, BDCP process. This is the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is a voluntary process to help those who are um, both to create a, an ecosystem restoration program in the Delta, but also to get permits so that pumping can continue for um, drinking water sources and irrigation purposes. It is a voluntary process. At any point in time, the process can stop. And the question is, if the process stops now or at the end of the BDCP process, what does the Department of Fish and Game do? Because they've been participating up until now in a good faith um, environment. If the folks that are already participating in the process stop participating, the Department of Fish and Game's mandates don't go away. They still have to protect fish species in the Delta. So the question is, well, what happens? And I think that's an open-ended question. Another issue, and an issue that we've brought up before in budget hearings, is the Marine Life Protection Act. Following the Marine Life Management Act, there are two separate um, issues, uh, in 1999, Fish and Game was required to review marine protection areas. And these are areas where specific species or an environment of species um, are under, um, have been reduced either by fishing or by natural, um, natural activities or otherwise. Um, the department has proposed about $4.4 .4 million of general fund and a small additional amount of, um, of special funds to fund the program. However, our concerns are that this is not even nearly what the department has said that the funding should be for the program, both in terms of enforcement. There are, the department has claimed that there aren't enough game wardens to go out and protect these areas, which is, which is going to lead to increased poaching. And then second of all, there's a, a, a broad array of concerns that have brought, been brought by the public in terms of is there sufficient public participation in this process? Is, are the marine protection areas that they're looking at as part of this process, do they, are they, do they have a foundation in science? And then again, this long-term ongoing funding source. In past years, we've recommended the program stop entirely until a long-term funding source is developed because it would be hard for the department to fulfill its mandate unless we can find some sort of funding source. <coughs> and then uh, just uh, two more general issues. Um, department of Fish and Game also has an activity with renewable energy and citing renewable energy. And that's, in, in general, it has to do with environmental, um, the Endangered Species Act. Um, in uh, November 2008, by executive order, the governor set up a streamlining um, permit process. And that was to create a multi-species conservation planning process, mainly in the desert, so that um, we can uh, uh, permit multiple renewable projects in one, um, in, in one in take permit, essentially. Uh, it's a lot like a natural, an NCCP, the Natural Community Conservation Planning Process. 
So the question is, where's the department in developing these plans? It was set up by executive order, but the department was funded through the budget process, so the legislature did agree to the process. And again, the question is, we've set up a process. What's the long-term funding for this program? Should it continue to come from energy agencies and from the permitting, or is there some other way that the legislature wishes to see this move forward? And then lastly, to address the, the key issue for the day is, is performance-based budgeting appropriate for the Department of Fish and Game? There are a number of issues that don't have to do with budgeting that the department has to address to meet its statutory requirements. We have attempted performance-based budgeting before, and there are some dangers which I'll lay out. The dangers are that when the priorities are unclear, or when the perform performance measures are not meaningful. So, for example, if we just count how many salmon there are in a year, that doesn't necessarily make, make or break a performance measure because, as we know, salmon come in an, on a three-year basis. They don't, the numbers for one year don't mean that the entire species has recovered. Or however many acres of wetlands restored, that may not be the performance measure that we want for to tie to a budget. The, the question is, if we use performance-based budgeting, what is the correct way to tie the budget to the legislature's priorities and to have the department be accountable without this becoming an additional administrative burden on top of their existing activities? Right. How do we incorporate this into their ongoing programs and have this be sort of a core function of the department? So the broad question is, should they adopt performance-based budgeting? And then lastly, uh, we will just briefly go over some of our recommendations. The first one, though, I think is, is uh, appropriate to this discussion. And we've talked about this a little bit. There, there are multiple fee-based funding sources in the Department of Fish and Game. They're narrowly prescribed. It doesn't actually have to be this way. In other departments, such as the water boards, they have multiple fees that are related to water quality. They're still <coughs> fees. They still pay for the department's programs, but they're put into a broader pot and then distributed out to pay for programs as, as needed. They don't necessarily go back to the exact same region that the permit was taken from, but they pay for water quality in the state. The question is, is can we use this? And we would say that yes, the, the legislature has the authority to um, broaden the, the pots that the funding goes into. So instead of just getting a, and I'm sorry to use the sea urchins, but instead of getting a sea urchin take permit, you could have a, a, a permit where you just pay a hunting and fishing license. And even if you have to tack on the stamp or, or whatever it is, that can still go into the main pot. So. I would also say that this actually doesn't necessarily diminish transparency for the department. It may give them the kind of flexibility that folks are really looking for from the Department of Fish and Game. And then secondly, we were asked to look at where um, general fund can be shifted to fees. And we've had two recommendations over time, um, both in the Endangered Species Act review as well as the um, NCCP review, both of which fees are allowed and are common um, from other lead agent, or, I'm sorry, from other permitting agencies. Uh, the department has the authority to establish those fees. The legislature may need to establish an account. Um, however, mm. it can be done. And so we would recommend that those be considered as we move forward. And as I've said, I'm here this morning and part of the afternoon. Mark Newton's here this morning as well. Terrific. Well, Captain, thank you. That was a, a, a pretty comprehensive flyover uh, of the issues that we're going to cover today with the department. Uh, we appreciate that context to get us started, and uh, now we'll hear from the director of uh, the, the department, John McCammon. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Is this on? I can you know, I members of the so. committee. It's, uh, yeah. th thank you very much for the opportunity to present today on behalf of the Department of Fish and Game. It's good to be the guinea pig for your performance-based uh, <laughs> review. I'm John McCammon. I have the honor of leading the 2,100 men and women who um, hold the public trust responsibility for fish and wildlife in the state as the d department's director. We look forward to working with the legislature and our partner organizations to find solutions for the many issues continuing to face the department. 
As a result of legislative mandates and the court decisions, the mission of the department has dramatically expanded over year, the years. In 1870, we began with the mission of managing fishing and hunting throughout the state, which mostly consisted of commissioners monitoring wildlife and hunters and fishermen. Today, our mission incorporates managing California's diverse fish, wildlife, and plant resources and the habitats upon which they depend for their ecological value and for their use and enjoyment by the public. Not only did our mission multiply mani manifold, but our understanding of the biology and the ecosystem management and the underlying science has expanded exponentially as well, adding complexity to the management obligations that we've incurred. Um, our obligations and responsibilities are encompassed in the Fish and Game Code, which I think you all have copies of the, uh, the code, and in Title 14, which are the regulations adopted by the uh, Commission largely and some by the Department, uh, which govern the activities of the Department. Uh, these obligations include enforcing and then pr promoting the voluntary compliance of fish and game regulations, providing hunting and fishing opportunities based on sound science, operating 23 hatcheries in which we stock almost 4 million pounds of salmon, steelhead, and trout throughout the state, conducting scientific assessments of our fish and wildlife populations, developing and implementing strategies to manage wildlife disease and responding to, to potential outbreaks of disease, evaluating lands for consideration for acquisition for the benefit of fish and wildlife, directly managing over a million acres of California uh, as a wildlife and ecological reserve, broken into 758 different parcels from every corner of the state, working with public agencies, landowners, and other private interests to, to develop natural community conservation plans to conserve and, and enhance wildlife resources developing and managing numerous partnerships that will establish a comprehensive approach to the soon to be completed network of marine protected areas under the MLPA, protecting vulnerable species through project review, CESA listing and permitting as a responsible agency under California Endangered er, uh, Environmental Quality Act, timber harvest plan review and lake and stream bed alteration agreements, in several instances each year, we are lead agency under CEQA as well, mm -hmm. working to control and prevent invasive species infestations, managing and restoring, and restoring wetlands, direct involvement in water rights, water quality, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission hydroelectric permitting, in-stream flow studies, Central Valley Water Operations and the California Water Plan, responding as lead agency for pollution spill uh, prevention and response, both through OSPR and inland pollution response, mm -hmm. advising local governments, various commissions, and working groups regarding biological, technical, and conservation-related issues, working with individuals and government agencies to resolve depredation problems and other wildlife conflicts and increasing challenge due to the growth and development in rural communities and natural areas and expansion of agricultural activities educating the public on fish and wildlife conservation and wildlife public safety issues, serving as a principal contact for wildlife issues in the state, issuing 288, this was an incredible number, 288 different permits, stamps, and licenses, which are the, we're the second largest licensing agency in the state, hmm. and who's, providing- Who's first? Uh, DMV issues more okay. licenses. Just curious. Providing uh, public, although they don't have 288 different kinds of licenses, okay. I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> Providing public information and education materials ranging from regulation books, and I, I brought along a couple of examples, um, to uh, Outdoor California, which okay. I think you've all seen, mm -hmm. a public interest magazine, um, to uh, Cal Fish and Game, our quarterly science journal, mm -hmm. which has been published for nearly 100 years. Yeah. So. These responsibilities are divided among six land and one marine region. In addition, we provide direction and support for these regions through eight policy functions, a law enforcement division, and our team of professional and biologists and administrative support folks. As you can well, well imagine, carrying out all the above responsibilities can be and is increasingly challenging and complex. 
Add to this mixture a continuing growth in the state's human population, the impacts of changing climate, shifting public attitudes and expectations, and shrinking resources. It's no secret we do the best we can with the resources made available to us. This has been uh, recognized by the legislature, and I would draw your attention to Fish and Game Code Section 710 through 713, which acknowledges our chronic lack of funding to meet our mandates uh, and, and identifies some potential remedies in a listing in, that, uh, in those code sections. All in all, we must live within our means. Just as our mission evolves, so do our challenges. The breadth and depth of responsibility entrusted in the department is, is, is immense and continually growing. The department is tasked with environmental review and expedited permitting of renewable portfolio standards, RPS qualified renewable projects, energy projects. We are actively working with the California Energy Commission in a combined permitting process to site thermal solar projects under the Warren Aliquist Act. Additionally, we are working with uh, our federal partners, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, to permit projects utilizing non-thermal technologies under CESA and the Lake and Stream Med Alteration Authority. Over 400 renewable projects have been proposed in California, and to date the department has engaged 245 of these projects for consultation and approximately 85 projects for more de detailed environmental per permitting including 40 projects which are seeking federal stimulus funding under the ARRA funding program. The department has taken a leadership role in climate change adaptation. We are the first state wildlife agency in the country to designate a lead scientist to coordinate climate change adaptation efforts department-wide. The department's climate change advisor has successfully pulled together um, a diverse group of stakeholders to craft a collective vision for climate change adaptation actions for fish and wildlife and habitats and is successfully integrating climate change planning into all our existing programs and tools. We continue to maintain a leadership role at the national, regional, and local level to encourage coordination and collaboration and ensure that fish and wildlife have a voice at the table in climate change adaptation efforts. One of our Outdoor California magazines was a climate change special which talks a lot about those programs. At the department, we are continuously looking for ways to improve and operate more effectively. In 2004, the department initiated a straight line reporting structure for the law enforcement division. This enabled a decrease in management positions and an increase in field level supervision or positions and consistent application of wildlife, wildlife laws and efficiencies with equipment and personnel. Along these same lines, we also created the water branch and reorganized, reorganized the Bay Delta region, consolidating the, in the department the transfer of ecosystem restoration program from CalFed and developing core focused regional staff working full time in the Delta counties. We have significantly enhanced our efforts in water, -based, water management based on these reorganizations and the development of specialized staff and the consolidation of funding they provided. Beginning in 2007, we developed seven strategic initiatives. In this process, the department looked at how to maximize existing resources and capitalize on new funding sources. These initiatives uh, signify the continual evolution of the department in its direction. The strategic initiatives were identified as key areas of focus and planning for the developing the department's priorities over the next five to 10 years. These included enhanced communication, education, and outreach developed statewide land stewardship based on need, developing strong water resource management program, developing stronger partnerships, improving our regulatory programs, enhancing organizational vitality by focusing on employee and internal administrative systems, and expanding our scientific capacity. As a part of it, <coughs> excuse me, as a part of implementing our science initiative as an example, one example, we adopted a pol uh, policy for quality in science and a list of key elements for scientific work. These ensure that our scientific work is the highest caliber possible. We are also the first state agency to sign on to the California Cooperative Ecological Studies Unit, a coalition of federal agencies and universities which will allow us to more easily enter into cooperative programs to carry out scientific research. Additionally, within the department, we are working to focus our staff and funding on the most pressing issues while maintaining core functions. 
To this direction, I have assembled a team to develop a process that is capable of aligning, the, and this gets right mm -hmm. to your program budget, um, the department's core values with our program and activities and with our funding and our budget structure to ensure transparency in the implementation of highest pri our highest priorities. <coughs> Excuse me. That process is due to be completed th later this year, and we look forward to implementing the difficult part, the findings, in order to ensure continued success and improvement within the department. And one of the earlier discussions about identifying our core mission, we talk about it as core values, because in fact they are held values by the department, and we are in that process right now of organizing and figuring out how to describe those core values. In order to continue to be successful and to ex excel in our mission, we must develop and foster partnerships with a vast array of constituencies. And we can accomplish more for our diverse natural resources more aggress aggressively and efficiently if we come together to find common ground to solutions and complex challenges that we face. A few significant partnerships. <coughs> My apologies. The Marine Life Protection Initiative. Uh, working with Natural Resources Agency, this pr partnership has brought outside private and other public agency funds to bear uh, on implementing this significant legislation, a direction from the legislature to protect marine, re marine resources. The Central Valley Joint Venture, the coalition of government, nonprofit, and local conservation organizations that work on habitat needs of our resident migratory birds in the Central Valley, and a core issue for the department. The California Rangeland Conservation Coalition, a non-traditional group of landowners, environmental organizations, and government working to enhance rangeland for the benefit of the species and habitat. Those are just three examples mm -hmm. of many that we use partnerships to accomplish our goals. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I was in D.C. for the weekend in the snow, so I think it's caught up with me. Mm -hmm. um, while we are always improving and planning for future successes, we know the department will continue to face challenges. We're working hard on fisheries management, the issue brought up a little earlier, um, uh, and know that this will be continue to be the, a challenge. The Pacific Fisheries Management Council and subsequently the Fish and Game Commission and the Federal Department of Commerce have closed salmon fishing for the past two years in most of California and in the ocean. We did a salmon crisis special edition for public information purposes, a salmon summit was convened at the department that included fisheries managers, scientists, water managers, harvest experts, enforcement chiefs, hatchery managers, and habitat biologists to address what mitigation measures DFG had taken so far and what could be done in the future. As a result of this effort, we have modified hatchery management and release of smolts. We've renewed restoration efforts at Battle and Butte Creeks grants programs to restore priority watersheds, key water negotiations to ensure future generations of young salmon have consistent flows to support their migration to the ocean, and how the set state sets seasons, evaluates the success of threatened or endangered salmon stocks, and monitors the outcome of habitat improvements. All parts of that program, a new initiative required as a result of the salmon crisis. Enforcement of state laws affecting salmon is a key piece of the puzzle. Warden issues, uh, wardens issue citations for illegal fishings, but their effort, efforts stretch far beyond issuing citations. They protect fisheries from overharvest, work with biologists to identify riverbed and stream alterations that violate state laws and reduce salmon chances for survival, and they serve as a critical link in an effort to educate the public on salmon issues and laws. Our marine program is participating in a lessons learned review to find ways to improve implementation of the Marine Life Management Act. Success at improving efficiency and effectiveness will be vital to the state's marine fisheries. The department is also actively participating in the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, a multi-agency and stakeholder planning and environmental per permitting process under the both Federal Endangered Species Act, the California Environmental Quality Act, and the Natural Communities Conservation Planning Act to restore habitat for fisheries in the Delta and improve water delivery reliability in California. The department assures coordinated water planning in the Delta through the process, which includes coordination with NOAA uh, NIMFS, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. 
We provide technical support to, and policy guidance to the BDCP steering committee and participate in technical work group meetings that support BDCP development. Uh, enforcement of all these laws and regulations is handled by our small law enforcement division consisting of 385 wardens, the thin green line between our natural <laughs> resources and those that would abuse the law. Our wardens are peace officers with broad jurisdiction, not only in the enforcement of fish and game codes, but the whole realm of traditional peace officer work, including first responder duties, pollution response, homeland security, to name a few. In a survey completed by the National Association of Conservation Law Enforcement Chiefs, California ranked lowest in the number of wardens per capita in the United States. Increased warden staffing will be one of our key challenges and goals for the future. This concludes my formal testimony and I would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. In addition, I look forward to working with the committee and with our partner organizations to address concerns that need addressing in the department. Yeah. Thank you, Director McCammon. Thanks for being here and battling through a cold uh, to, to share with us uh, the, the very broad uh, efforts that are underway by the department. Um, I had uh, kind of planned to uh, hold questions until the end, but let me ask you, and I know we may lose uh, Chairman Ruskin shortly, so uh, are you going to be able to hang around or would you prefer to take questions now? Um, since I know you you probably have some other things on your plate today. Yeah, I do, uh, I'll, I'll be able to stay around for about another 45 minutes now, but uh, we'll be coming back this afternoon too. So, well, let way. me ask Mr. Ruskin then. I, I know we don't. We're going to lose you. Okay, so we probably have time to continue and then do questions. Yeah. So, great. I appreciate that uh, very much. So let's go now to uh, John Carlson, who's the executive director of the California Fishing Game Commission. Welcome, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Chair Huffman. <coughs> uh, yeah, I am John Carlson, Executive Director of Fish and Game Commission. I would like to uh, also thank you for this opportunity. Uh, this is a rare opportunity to talk about the stories of the department and the commission, and um, I'm really pleased to see how many folks are here in the audience on a rainy day. Uh, just goes to show how much interest there is in the department and its mission. Um, I'm going to give a brief background on the commission and then talk a little bit about the relationship between the Commission and the Department, which is very important in my, in my mind. Uh, the the uh, Commission was established by state legislature back in 1870, and uh, it became a constitutional body in 1940 by ballot initiative. Today we have approximately 200 duties and responsibilities delegated by the legislature and specified throughout the Fish and Game Code. Commission activities directly affect all Californians including those with commercial and recreational interests and those interested in the intrinsic value of fish and wildlife resources. Our commission is a five member uh, commission. They are appointed by the governor with a confirmation by the Senate within their first year and then they serve for six year terms. They are compensated $100 per day up to five days a month. So they're basically volunteers, uh, very dedicated citizens who have a real passion for fish and wildlife issues. Um, and they put in a lot of time into this effort. Support staff for the commission, actual paid employees. We have um, a small staff of currently consisting of eight employees. That level has not changed in uh, approximately 20 years, um, even though our mandates and our, uh, our duties have gone up. Uh, we are tasked, and that, that employees includes me, we're tasked with the administrative matters for the commission um, activities and holding 10 public meetings a year, several uh, special hearings, and then several subcommittee meetings by the commission. Two of our, the active subcommittees are the Marine Resources Committee and the Al Tauscher Committee to enhance hunting and fishing opportunities within California. We also have a unique situation with a uh, grant funded position that we use to help with marine advice. We have a marine advisor who helps our staff and the commission and the department on marine advice and helps set up our marine resources committee meetings, which are um, about four a year and they're very actively attended by the public and stakeholders. Um, a primary task for the commission staff involves completing the regulation packages in compliance with the provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act and as reviewed by the Office of Administrative Law. Right now we're running at about 40 to 50 of these packages a year. They take a minimum of three hearings a year, uh, I mean per package, 
public hearings and a lot of paperwork and follow up to comments from the public. So it's a lot involved. Those set the regulations in Title 14 for the department and the public to uh, um, that interprets and enhances the code. Briefly, the commission deals with uh, their main duties are formulating policies for the conduct of the Department of Fish and Game, uh, prescribing terms and conditions under which various permits and licenses are issued by the uh, department, regulating commercial fisheries, regulating aspects of aquaculture, kelp, and state water bottom leases, implementing regulations governing recreational take of various fish and wildlife species, listing and delisting species under the provisions of the California Endangered Species Act, and conducting appeal hearings for people who have had permits denied or revoked by the department. There's two code sections that direct the commission and uh, the department on how the commission relates to the department as far as um, the policies. And I'd like to read the two, they're both short sections. Um, Fish and Gabe Code Section 104 states that the commission may employ a staff, including an executive director, to assist the commission in conducting its operations, but neither the commission nor its staff shall have or be given any powers in relation to the administration of the department. Uh, there's, a, there's an often uh, misconception out there by folks in the public that the commission actually can run the department. This clearly states the commission does not have powers in relation to the administration of the department. Can, can I ask, I, I, I of course was going to save this question until the end, but it's, sure. it's, it's sort of jumping out from what you just said. How can you have uh, a law that says you set policy uh, for the department and that you prescribe conditions for how the department manages permits and, license and licenses when you just told us that you have no ability to direct the operations of the department? Isn't there a disconnect there? Um, yeah, and there's one other code section let me get into that also makes it a little even, uh, even a little more fuzzy, but this is Fish and Game Code um, from the legislature and, and the governor. It does make it, um, and I'll talk into the re re our relationship also, because it makes the relationship um, a little bit ambiguous, no doubt about it, and it is a frustration for some folks. Uh, this other Fish and Game Code section, which I think will help a little bit also, 703A, General policies for the conduct of the department shall be formulated by the commission. The director shall be guided by those policies and shall be responsible to the commission for the administration of the department in accordance with those policies. So that gives a little more teeth to the commission's policies and the day-to-day, -day, or I'm sorry, the overall administration of the department. But I think what the legislature and the governor intend is that the commission cannot have day-to-day -day, um, power over the department, but has overarching policy power and then the commission also then sets the title 14 regulations which prescribes how the department gives out the permits and the um, conditions on those permits All right, well we, we may come back to uh, this disconnect sure. because it's sure. still not clear to me how you can have the ability to set policy for the department when you have no authority to direct the, the department right and, and what and well let me jump in then to the relationship because that is a concern um, a concern I have, and I know that some uh, commissioners have this concern, that kind of puts us in a situation with our working relationship between the commission and the department. In my opinion, it's a fine line, and what happens is if you have a administration and a department um, leadership that and a commission that get along, things work pretty well. And I'm happy to say right now, we're, in my opinion, I will, I'll let John speak for himself, but in my opinion, we are getting along well. John's a nice guy. I mean, Yes, <laughs> yes. We play golf every now and then, and uh, <laughs> I don't count how many strokes he takes. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the fine line, though, there is because these are ambiguous enough code sections that are our, our guidance and our authorities, that if you ran into a situation like about 8 to 15 years ago where – the relationship between the commission and the department was not good, not real good. And you'd have several meetings in a row, sometimes years in a row, where a director, past directors would not come to commission meetings at all. Um, it was rough. And to me, that hinders the ability of the commission and the department to really get its main job done, the critical functions, the, you know, the core missions done, and get, get, you know, the infighting was precluding that. But we don't have the policy guidance or the code guidance that really, if you had a rough relationship, I agree mm -hmm. with you. There's problems here in this, this overall um, authority. 
on how we work together. Okay. I'm happy to say, though, over the last probably at least four years, over the last three directors, we've had um, really good cooperation between the commission and the directors, and um, I think the working relationship has been good. Um, the other thing that makes this even a little bit more um, problematic in the past was the commission did not have its own budget. We did not have our own line item budget or our own um, program in the governor's budget. So up until two years ago, a member of the public who wanted to see what kind of funding the commission got, what kind of staffing levels, they couldn't find it. It was buried within the Department of Fish and Games distributed admin. Now, two years ago, with support from the department and from the agency, we set up our own program level, as uh, the LAO mentioned, it's program 61 within the department's seven top you know, programs in the budget, and it's a fish and game program level. So now there's transparency to the public and to the legislature on what kind of resources the commission staffing and um, our expenses to hold 10 meetings a year and, and our special uh, hearings is. So that, that was a step in the right direction, and that would not have happened without cooperation from the department and the agency and the administration. So mm -hmm. I think that was a but good The department move. sets your budget. Uh, no, actually, now it's really the legislature. The, the, I mean, the administration okay. makes the proposals. Right. Um, do you have input into your own budget? We have input. With, I work closely with the department. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a suggestion about how to ensure that these bodies all work together well, and we should just go fishing together. <laughs> well, <laughs> if the fishery was closed, golf. they might be able to do that. But. Uh, uh, along those lines, uh, I'm glad we get, were able to talk a little bit about the relationship. And, and like I say, right now we've had a good relationship, but but the way the laws are written, um, if the relationship was poor, you could have um, some real problems on getting the job done. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention as far as outreach from the commission, and um, the department's been very supportive of this, so has the legislature. Back in 03, we had an independent video company start showing up in our public meetings on their own dime, filming and video transmitting uh, live across the internet the meetings. As that grew and grew and grew, um, and the expectation became higher and higher, uh, they ended up losing their grant funding. And uh, three years ago, the legislature stepped up and appropriated um, some money. So we are now, for about seven years now, have had every commission meeting filmed and uh, put across the internet. Uh, and they are also all archived via our website through the uh, the contractor that's doing this this we've had some incredible uh, views on on some of our big meetings back in uh, 06 the first MLPA session we had 44,000 uh, hits during a live meeting and 70,000 hits that month on the archive so it's it pretty impressive and we found that it can be a little bit of a double-edged sword. We'll get uh, folks who, uh, I warn folks at the beginning of the meeting that what you say is gonna be on film. We'll have legislative staffers watching, we'll have members- Watch out of for live microphones. With, uh, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm constantly yeah. turning off microphones, <laughs> but that's uh, part of my job. But I think it's been a great outreach and um, we're really happy that this is still continuing even in these yeah. tough budgetary times because it brings the, you know, the commission process and the department story to the public, and uh, I think it's been very successful. The last thing that I'd like to mention is that the commissioners do have concerns over the department's budget and staffing levels, and there, um, there has been some frustration based on, you know, these code sections that the commission really doesn't have a um, solid role in helping prioritize the budget with the legislature and the administration. It's It's really, you know, more of a uh, recommendation role. That's something that I think some commissioners would like to explore in the future to have some more um, involvement to help the department. Um, they'd also like to see a stable funding source, as was you know mentioned by the LAO, yeah. a more stable force uh, um, funding source, kind of that where all citizens chip in because the fish and wildlife resources of the state are really yeah. everybody's uh, treasure. You know, we meet with uh, all the western states twice a year, their commissions and their directors and their fishing game agencies, and we get a lot of ideas. And it's, uh, of course, California is really <coughs> unique with the size of the department, the size of our population, the size of our budgets. So um, I guess I'll end with saying that if there are future efforts, any type of a blue ribbon panel or any type of a oversight panel that wants to look in detail about 
commission and department um, budgets, the commission would really like to be actively involved and uh, would, uh, is very interested in, in uh, helping with this. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Carlson. So um, last from our panelists, we're going to hear uh, about that thin green line that the director referred to. Uh, so Jerry Carno joins us from the Fish and Game Wardens Association. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, uh, the wardens typically don't have these opportunities very often, but we do. Um, uh, the director, John McCammon, has a pretty tough job. I mean, the, uh, and what I've found out in my career, I've been a warden for uh, uh, going on 21 years, is it's probably one of the most div- diverse uh, state departments in California. Uh, I think the department has their tendrils and just about everything. Um, I, r- I really appreciate the LAO being here. I mean, I think it's very important, uh, and, and I, I appreciate the words that you had. Uh, and I know the LAO's done some reports um, on the wardens and warden staffing, um, and the Warden Association has war stories for you. So I really appreciate you to be here, being here, and, and you can look to us for, for those war stories and, and the things that we meet directly with the people in, in the field from every walk of life. Um, and uh, so, and uh, I've worked with uh, John Carlson uh, with the commission, and they've been um, uh, fantastic working with the Warden Association. Really pr- uh, appreciate that. Um, but basically, I, I um, and I feel pretty good because I uh, prepared a speech, and Diane told me I, I have only like five minutes, and you guys talked like way longer than that. So <laughs> I got plenty of time. Now don't right? don't take any excessive liberties so, here. Uh, and I'm going to be shorter. Right. I'm going to be shorter. Just because so. you carry a gun doesn't mean you can. Uh, yeah. I'm unloaded. Right. I'm uh, right. unarmed right now. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so that you know. You're done. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, the mission of the Department of Fish and Game Law Enforcement Division is to protect the habitat, water, wildlife, and fisheries of California while providing public safety and maintaining a highly trained and professional workforce to continue that protection into the future. That, that's in our code book, um, or actually a policy. Uh, the Department of Fish and Game, I back up, the California Fish and Game Wardens Association works to protect wildlife resources and game wardens and their families. We believe the department, uh, the law enforcement mission is in peril. Mm -hmm. The association absolutely supports the mission of the department and the staff, but we require the resources needed to do the job. The department as a whole, not just wardens, has been tasked with many more responsibilities than they have been provided resources with which to fulfill those responsibilities. The Fish and Game Commission, over objections from many sources, continues to approve new regulations placing more duties on the warden force. Laws and regulations set forth by the commission will not be effective without a strong enforcement component by wardens. Shamefully, like the director mentioned, California has the lowest ratio of wardens to population of any state or province in North America. That includes Canada. The natural resources in California held in trust for the people of California are in jeopardy as a result. Game wardens began protecting California's natural resources in 1871, making us the oldest law, state law enforcement, uniforms law enforcement officers in our state. Elimination of enforcement positions in the last decade, current law enforcement division staffing the same as 60 years ago, and cutting wardens through mm-hmm. furloughs three additional days from the field a month has been extremely damaging to our natural resources. Commercialization and poaching of all wildlife is rampant. Pollution spills go unchecked, the shortage of wardens has led to the degradation of fisheries, water, and wildlife, and less opportunity to protect hu- human life. Wardens are the frontline defense for all natural resources that belong to all 38 million Californians. Wildlife crime, habitat destruction, and water pollution are out of control in our state. Warden investigations document the illegal take of wildlife with regularity. Our work establishes there is both a statewide and worldwide network in the illegal trade of fish and wildlife. Mm. Water pollution continues to plague our state, and game wardens are there to hold accountable individuals and companies that ignore pollution laws. It's tragic our state professes to be a leader in the green movement, yet will not hire or maintain enough staffing required to protect our natural resources. To make matters even more difficult for Department of Fish and Game, the dangers and complex responsibilities of working in the specialized law enforcement field, coupled with the current pay scale, the department's ability to effectively recruit and retain qualified wardens is compromised. Again, having a direct negative impact on public safety, our natural resources, fish and wildlife, 
our water quality, and our ability to provide for public safety and respond to natural disasters. The state depends upon and expects tremendous responsibilities from each warden, some whom are the only DFG law enforcement presence for entire counties by themselves, and many maintain an in-home office for no compensation. Add the dangers wardens face on patrol because they must know more than standard law enforcement responsibilities, the penal code, the vehicle code, health and safety code, the fishing game code, environmental laws, as well as federal regulations, work at a detective and investigative level right out of the academy, confront firearms as routine, and regularly encounter dangerous armed criminals who have no regard for human safety and poachers who are nothing more than wildlife thieves. A couple of these complex responsibilities makes few people want to become game wardens. Those issues along with low salaries, long hours, lack of backup, and other inequities mean that the Department of Fish and Game has lost the ability to effectively recruit and retain qualified individuals. California has lost and does not appreciate that the Warden Force is the best equi equipped law enforcement division in the state prepared 24-7 to deal with all natural disasters and homeland security issues. Now remember, our, our patrol vehicles are, mm -hmm. I mean, the, uh, there's game wardens that are willing to sleep in their, their patrol cars because it's so so far away from their, their headquarters. Uh, so they usually have a couple days worth of food and they're willing to recline the seat and, and sleep if they can't drive home because they're so tired. But, but basically, um, we have the weaponry, fully outfitted, full drive police vehicles equipped to tow boats and trailers, supplied with survival and rescue gear, have night vision, have state-of-the-art optics, uh, some wardens have $2,000 pair of binoculars, and the difference between a, a Bushnell and a Swarovski is, is unbelievable when, when we have the ability to see what's going on out there. We have aircraft. Uh, in fact, I, I believe one of our pilots is in the audience uh, today. Uh, many boats, including state-of-the-art ocean vessels, know the landscape, cities, and waterways, and each officer has survival instincts by the mere fact that they must patrol alone and confront all situations alone, even if that means having to camp out in their patrol vehicle to get the job done. And every Californian benefits, Californian benefits from this. The Warden Force is still operated in 1950s staffing levels. Warden staffing ratios must be tied to increasing California population and laws or regulations. Any future mandates on the Warden Force should be contingent upon adequate funding from a dedicated and stable source. The Law Enforcement Division is a core program of the Department of Fish and Game. Many worthwhile programs that originated in the legislature with good, inten good intentions are being moved forward without appropriate resources for effective enforcement and implementation and will therefore not provide the anticipated environmental benefit. The Wardens Association recommends that the legislature revisit Fish and Game Code Section 710 that states the legislature acknowledges such unfunded mandates, she already mentioned that today, mm -hmm. and amend that section to provide real funding for every mandate and an immediate suspension of any regulation without a funding source for en enforcement and implementation. Absent such direction, the Department of Fish and Game and the Fish and Game Commission will continue down the road of a constant stream of new regulations that sound good in theory, but only s serve to stretch the warden force even thinner, which will eventually result in another on-duty injury or death to a warden. State-mandated furloughs have devastated us, not only financially, but Im more importantly, furloughs affect our worth as peace officers, sending more, many to work for other well-funded law enforcement organizations while others retire as quickly as possible. We work side by side with other state peace officers who are exempt from furloughs. Three days forced off a month equates to roughly, uh, it's fluid, but 175 of us in the field. And that's basically taken the 14% uh, that, that that equals. Fellow law enforcement agencies, uh, especially sheriff's departments, are frustrated that game wards are not available to respond to their calls for service that they receive for trespassing and weapons violations, pollution of, uh, events, and wildlife issues. I, I've sat at the table with many uh, elected sheriffs that, that have voiced this frustration to me uh, year after year after year, and it's the first thing, a topic of a lot of the meetings that, that I go to in the, in the counties that I patrol. Informants and citizens quit calling in to poacher hotlines because many calls go an unanswered, and wardens 
on furlough agonize because they cannot respond to many constituent calls within the communities they patrol. It's pretty tough to be anonymous in, in, your, in your district, especially when you're the only law enforcement presence for, a, for entire county. So it's really hard to hide. And you know, you're, doing, you're mowing your lawn in the front and uh, the sheriff's department shows up for highway patrol because they want something from you. That happens all the time. Like I said, you know, we maintain a, an office out of our house. Serial poachers have emerged on a devastating level, putting even more pressure on the public, our wildlife, fisheries, and game wardens. The cost to manage the, to the rebound of species and habitats and increased numbers of complex criminal investigations cost the state millions or more to taxpayers due to the lack of enforcement. As an example, recent legislation was passed and signed by the governor to address both water supply and endangered species. It includes an initiative to finance billions of dollars of both infrastructure and habitat restoration to reconcile the conflicts between water supply and fisheries driven by continued declines of endangered species. The harvest of white sturgeon and Chinook salmon has recently been restricted to ensure sustainable fisheries are maintained. In all of these efforts, the inability to ensure timely and effective wildlife law enforcement has the potential for truly catastrophic impacts. Harvest of white sturgeon, both legal and illegal, in excess of projected take can push the species from a sustainable sport fishery to candidate spe species for federal and or state listing. A single gill net illegally deployed during spring and fall run salmon and steelhead spawning can frustrate the benefit of literally billions of dollars invested to date in fisheries restoration and create public skepticism and interest in approving yet billions more of taxpayer dollars for the water bond. Given the status of fisheries and the crisis in the Delta, I urge the legislature to make sure the governor and the public understand the potential consequence of inadequate wildlife law enforcement, which is compounded by the mandatory furloughs driven by the budget crisis. The old adage, if you build it, they will, they will come, may apply to sports stadiums, but it does not apply to fisheries. It would be tragic to invest billions only to fail because the resource was diminished beyond recovery by poaching. California truly has incredible wildlife, fisheries, habitat, and opportunities to take part in enjoying those resources that enhances the quality of our lives and well-being. California has a great deal to protect, and protection must be paramount to the legislature and to the citizens of the state. In a February 2006 story in National Geographic titled California's Wild Crusade, it states California is one of the world's most noted hotspots of biodiversity mm -hmm. in the world. An Animal Planet film crew, while filming in California in 2006, which have traveled places worldwide, said our state was one of the most beautiful and diverse places they have vi visited in the world, in wildlife, waterways, and landscapes. Game wardens want to thank all who support and offer help. As individuals come to understand our plight, we find support growing tremendously. The people of California tr truly feel it's important to have their fish, wildlife, landscapes, and drinking water protected and come to realization it all belongs to them. Wildlife, fish, and poachers, they don't care about budgets, furloughs, or politics. It means nothing to them. But something must be done to increase enforcement. I mean, whatever it takes. And um, I, this is... I think this is the fifth year that I've been coming into the Capitol, and um, uh, we're just, I think we're just getting rolling. But something has to be done, and I really appreciate uh, the chair taking the ball to, to put this together, and I think you put together an appropriate first panel. Thank you. Well, thank you for being part of it. Um, so we're going to now come back to questions from the, the committee members, and I'd like to uh, take the chair's prerogative to begin with uh, Director McCammon. Um, John, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's a little bit technical and inside baseball, but some recent events have happened that relate to our fisheries protections under the California Endangered Species Act, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about that. Um, the uh, Department of Water Resources CESA permit for the operation of the State Water Project is, of course, premised on consistency determinations with a series of federal biological opinions for uh, delta smelt, 
a couple of runs of salmon, and I believe at least to some extent long fin smelt, which is uniquely listed under the under CESA. Uh, there was a temporary restraining order uh, granted last week, knocking out uh, key portions of the salmon biological opinion. And just yesterday, I was told that uh, the Westlands Water District filed for a temporary restraining order to take out, or at least attempt, attempt to take out the biological opinion for Delta smelt. So it would appear, um, I and the Department of Water Resources, by the way, has supported both of those legal actions to invalidate the biological opinions that actually form the basis for its permit from your department to operate the state pumps. Um, it's pretty high stakes uh, issues underway, and the question that I need to ask you is what assurance can you provide us that you carrying out your mission that we've been talking about here today will make sure that the Department of Water Resources um, complies with state fisheries protections, including has some type of CESA coverage uh, as it continues to move forward? Uh, I, I can tell you that we're working very closely with the Department of Water Resources right now uh, to try and uh, determine the CESA implications of the federal court action. Uh, and uh, um, thus far, the Department of Water Resources has assured us they will not increase, have not increased uh, the level of pumping that's occurring at their pumping plant, which would nominally be available to them under the federal court order. So the solution so far is that they are complying with the terms and conditions of the consistency determination, even though the consistency determination itself may or may not be valid. There's some legal debate about that at the moment. So, so there's been no increase in pumping pursuant to the TRO? Under the, if, uh, for the operation of the state pumps. For the state. State water project. Okay, and, and do I understand you to say that the department has assured you that, that even going forward, if a, if a second TRO is granted on the smelt BO, there won't be any state project increase? Thus far. Um, th there is an ongoing debate about the uh, nature of the state uh, consistency determination and how that works relative mm -hmm. to the federal court action and the potential for having to replace that with a 2081, a uh, permit under Fish and Game Code 2081. Um, uh, and that the terms and conditions of such an action are going to have to be worked out. Okay. Just to cut right to it, would it be fair to, to uh, assume that if the biological opinions are taken out by the federal court uh, and the department does increase pumping, that you are going to require CESA, a, a CESA permit from them? Uh, it certainly will take a CESA permit for them to continue operation of the pumps. Uh, so yes, there'll okay. be some some form of coverage under right. one of the variations, 2081 or consistency or some mechanism provided in the code. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about the Delta legislation. Uh, the members of this committee are very familiar with uh, the package of reforms and, and you know the centerpiece of which being the governance and policy. Uh, reforms for the Delta. Um, a critical piece of all of that succeeding, of course, is your department. Uh, we are asking you to provide biological objectives to the department. You are going to be uh, participants at some level in some critical proceedings before the state board to set public trust flow criteria that are going to be needed to achieve the ecosystem goals. And, of course, for BDCP, you are the key agency to decide whether the proposed plan satisfies the high standards of an NCCP. Right. And so I'd like to ask you whether you feel like um, you're equipped uh, right now uh, to do those jobs. And I want to, frankly, give you a little bit of a, of a softball uh, on this, Director McCammon, because I gave your predecessor a softball the last time we had a director in that chair and asked him to provide us uh, an assurance that um, BDCP uh, will be held to a very rigorous standard uh, as he approaches the approval of that uh, so that we could all have a confidence level uh, that this NCCP requirement means something. Um, I have to tell you candidly, I was disappointed in his response. He, he, instead of speaking to that, spoke to the need for infrastructure for water projects, which I thought was maybe representing a different agency uh, than the one we thought we had testifying. So uh, there's a softball in this question, but also a little bit more of a specific ask uh, of uh, how you're doing in approaching the new responsibilities that we've given you uh, under the Delta legislation. 
I, th I think uh, change from the last time that that question was asked in this forum uh, is the explicit action of the legislature in that legislation to require that the plan meet the NCCP standard. It was always the programmatic goal. It was always the agreed upon approach. Um, but the ex explicit determination of the, by the legislature that uh, it must meet that NCCP standard uh, will have to change the response that you get and say that, yes, we are, we are uh, uh, I think, uniquely um, situated in order to determine whether or not it meets an NCCP standard. Um, we are have some resources. Uh, to enable us to accomplish that. We're working cooperatively in the steering committee and elsewhere to ensure that that standard is met. Um, uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that everyone involved in the process acknowledges that that standard does set a higher bar and does uh, uh, kind of focus everybody's attention towards this, that higher bar. Um, so we're working towards uh, accomplishing that, and we feel confident at this point that we're going to get to that result. And with respect to the new things, you might say unfunded mandates, if we were uh, listening to the, the Wardens Association, but we have asked you to develop biological uh, yeah. objectives and to engage in, in a, a series of pretty important uh, events that are going to take place on a very compressed time frame. Uh, for this Delta plan, and I'd like to ask you whether uh, you feel like you have the resources to uh, to step up to that challenge. Yeah, uh, we we have prepared, and I'm reviewing now uh, uh, our proposed testimony for the State Water Board in their initial proceedings, which I think are scheduled for March, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the determination of flow standards for the Delta. Um, there's a, a, a range of ways of approaching that, and. Um, because of the compressed time frames, because of the uh, limited amount of staff that we have that uh, has expertise in flow studies, um, uh, we're going through a s review of the existing science literature. We are uh, kind of focusing on uh, what we've done historically over since uh, 1964. We've been engaged in uh, flow studies uh, in in uh, associated with flows. Uh, having to do with the Delta and have done some pretty significant science associated with that. However, in-stream flow can be a lot of different things ranging from uh, transects of each uh, stream uh, section uh, and determination uh, section by section of uh, flow requirements through larger outflow kinds of studies. Um, uh, we're, not, we're not able to do the most finite version of that. We're having to do a relatively gross assessment in order to meet the time frames. Okay, let, let me, I know other members are going to have some questions, but let me ask one more, uh, and then I will um, pass the mic to others. Our a representative from the Wardens Association was pretty clear uh, about our inadequate support of the enforcement mission uh, from Fish and Game. Um, the Wardens Association and the Fish and Game Commission, if I'm not mistaken, have called upon the governor to exempt the wardens from the furlough program just as CHP and other law enforcement <laughs> officials have been exempted. Um, and so I, I just want to ask you as director, what is your view of that? Do you agree that uh, it's unacceptable to have this critical enforcement arm not treated the same way as CHP and other enforcement officials? The uh, latitude that I was given in, in uh, the determination of how furloughs would be implemented was to ensure that, and uh, uh, did take that uh, action, that we didn't have free Fridays where it was poaching day because there were no wardens on, <laughs> on staff. So we were able to, uh, under the authority granted in the, in the governor's executive order, we were able to uh, give them uh, floating furlough days instead of scheduled furlough days. Uh, that is the extent of the authority that I was able to. But, but they're still subject to furlough, unlike their counterparts at, at CHP. That's and so right. I, I want to um, just put it to you very directly. Uh, do you support uh, the efforts that have been put forward by the commission and others to exempt them consistent with the way we've treated um, highway patrol officers? Um, I support the governor's budget as as it was. A, a You're a good soldier, Director McKinn. <laughs> um, 
All right, other, other members, I think Mr. Ruskin had some questions, and then I think uh, Ms. Yamada and Ms. Cabrera. And, and I want to welcome uh, Ms. Saldana, who's here, uh, I think, with some questions about lobsters, if not <laughs> urchins and other critters. Okay. All right, good. We're glad to have you here. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's just uh, several uh, questions. Uh, well, let, first, uh, let me address some questions to the budget. We heard uh, the uh, Ms. Freeman uh, talking about uh, different uh, ways we could approach looking at the budget. When you take a look at the programmatic areas, the uh, pie chart, the carved up uh, pie. Mm -hmm. um, responding to uh, LAO's suggestion that one way of looking at the issue is to take a look at that pie chart and ask whether it's carved up in a way that's consistent with the priorities, policy priorities of the department. What's your initial uh, response to that? Yeah, uh, I, uh, it, recognizing, we've recognized, I guess, that the Policy priorities have changed over time, but our budget categories and the way that we allocate resources really haven't kept up with that process, uh, which is why I think this process may be beneficial. Um, uh, so uh, we have, have established a process to identify what I'm calling our core values, which really will get to the allocation of resources and how that pie chart will look. All right, good. So when you, uh, and you talked about the core values, the team you've set together, uh, you said the values w are what you call your core, mi your mission. Right. But when, as you're looking at that then, are you confident uh, then that is a form of performance-based uh, budgeting and uh, self-oversight. Right. So are you confident then that that, uh, um, that establishing uh, certain benchmarks and uh, criteria for performance evaluation uh, can work? Uh, that's uh, obviously we've said that that's what we're beginning here, right. what we're exploring in the LAO. Ms. Freeman said that one has to uh, evaluate whether benchmarks can be credible, right. whether they can be useful. Uh, how, how confident are you in that regard? Yeah, that, um, the department has lots of different kind of uh, measurements for its performance, and as uh, the LAO pointed out, uh, it's dangerous to try and count widgets against a natural community as an example. I mean, I just, I, that doesn't make much sense. However, you can count widgets in terms of um, number of licenses sold. So it, it varies throughout the department. And the, the department has such a breadth of responsibilities that it w would take some considerable analysis to identify the appropriate measurements for each of those right. uh, responsibilities. Because uh, you can uh, wear a quantitative measurements or counting widgets may not apply uh, qualitative measurements Correct. Uh, could apply instead and and those are sometimes very difficult to get to and measure over time mm -hmm. the um, that would include species trends though for example yeah. as opposed to particular number of fish in any given year mm -hmm. Al although I would hate to say that the department's uh, uh, direct actions uh, are kind of a sole or a independent criteria for how species are doing just because of factors like climate change, which really are um, not directly controllable. But this is something that really uh, obviously must be done thoughtfully, right. uh, the development of benchmarks, and uh, hopefully over time we can work together uh, to do that in a way that uh, can help us all accomplish our goals, but is meaningful and doesn't, as the LAO said, simply put another overlay of, uh, of cost over it without helping accomplish them. Yeah, but I mean, I certainly uh, agree with and support your notion that you have to know what you're getting when you allocate resources. I mean, that's a kind of an essential part of, of the budgeting process that we're not real good at, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you for your frankness. The, um, so, uh, the requirement to reduce employee workforces by 10 percent probably means that at the very least you're not going to be able to fill vacancies. Right. What will, uh, what do you imagine the impact of that will be? Um, we're concerned primarily that uh, not being able to fill vacancies uh, um, will result in uh, 
workforce determinations of where resources are allocated that don't have anything to do with the priorities but have to do with who happens to retire next month. That's the primary concern. So we're looking actually at how, how we're going to be able to reallocate uh, resources from one area to another without transgressing these specialized funds mm -hmm. issue, as noted by the LAO, uh, but trying to make sure that our uh, core functions are addressed in, even with that staffing reduction. Now, in a general sense, then, it sounds like uh, the uh, imagine the um, expected shortfall of about $5 million that's in the governor's budget, you are probably working, uh, considering how to realign resources as you do all the functions we've been discussing, and that's part of what you're working on. That, that, that is exactly uh, a, a case in point. Uh, we're looking at making sure that we have uh, uh, about 40 positions worth of, of effort is directed appropriately at our core missions instead of suctioned off because of who happens to retire next month. Okay. Uh, one or two more questions, if I might. Uh, I'd like to uh, address the, uh, the role of the commission. And I'm sure we can't find solutions to all the uh, ambiguities, but I'd like to explore it a, a little. So uh, can you reread the, um, the language that uh, presents the uh, ambiguity? There were two yeah, pieces I, of I language, think it was but it was the, the first one you read that right, I'd like you to reread. Right. Fish and Game Code Section 104, mm -hmm. which uh, the commission may employ a staff, including an executive director, to assist in the commission in uh, conducting its operations, but neither the commission nor its staff shall have or be given any powers in relation to the administration of the department. Yeah, and that certainly does present a problem. It reminds me of uh, uh, working on the uh, city council level uh, where the uh, city uh, appoints the city manager. Uh, the city I worked in was the city manager form of government, and the city appoints the city manager. There's a, um, a wall between the council and the, all the people working for the city manager. But the council has um, power over the city manager in that obviously to, uh, to hire and fire there and to uh, consider raises. And so there is there is um, uh, there is some power there. So just in, in the commission's role, uh, and without that in terms of the city, it would be uh, almost impossible to enforce the council's priorities. So in terms of the commission's role in vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the department, how um, in, uh, in cases of other, d uh, other departments and other commissions, uh, are there other examples that you can cite where uh, you have this ambiguity or either you have the ambiguity such as you have or where there is no ambiguity and it's effectively um, accounted for in the setup of the commission and, and, and the codes that regulate it. In other words, a com another commission that has pretty broad and specific regulatory power by law and yet functions as an advisory commission, which is right. Are there case, other cases where, where it functions so too much as an advisory commission or are there cases where it actually has teeth? Um, as we might, you know, you in, in understanding this, we might want to look at similar cases. Sure. Well, um, you know, amongst the Western states, there are several commissions that do have uh, much, m well, our commission has pretty much zero involvement in um, selecting the director of Fish and Game. Um, there are some states where the commissions, uh, like Nevada, the commission does public hearings and interviews and forwards three names to the governor, and the governor by law must mm. choose a director off of that list of three or return the list for a new list. Um, Arizona, the commission um, hires the director. Uh, my understanding is on a five-year contract to give some certainty mm. to that director. Because in the West right now, in the West, it is uh, the life expectancy of the average director is very short. Less than two years is my understanding. Um, California has a model of you're, that also. You're, 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 you're talking of. I know. I know. You're talking about his term in office, though, his professional West. life. Right. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> not life I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, on the job, um, in, their, in their position. Yes. 
good point. <clears throat> um, and John, under, he knows that. Um, but the, um, so there, there's often a struggle in the, many of the other states between the powers of the commission regulating or, or over the departments and the legislatures and the governors. And, um, you know, I don't know if there's a perfect model out there. Um, like I say right now, the commission and the department, I think, are working well together. Um, but there are these other models out there where the commissions have more of a role in selecting the director and um, being have, have some more teeth over a director in a department and in, in involved in its budgeting matters also. There are yeah. states that have a much more of a role of the commissions in the budgeting and the priorities of the budget. Just some broad thoughts about moving forward with this. Uh, while there's cooperation now, we can see that uh, whatever was intended in the legislation is really, uh, there, there's no significant um, mechanism for ensuring, uh, ensuring the commission's work actually gets carried out as intended by, obviously by the legislation or it wouldn't have been passed. And uh, we might want to think about establishing, uh, just how to establish benchmarks for it. So that in other words, one could ask, uh, given the benchmark, given what the regulations that the uh, commission is uh, uh, issuing, uh, how do we judge whether those uh, regulations are being carried out? And is it? A, and if it is being carried out, then there's no issue. If it isn't being carried out, we would have to identify: is that because they're simply not being uh, paid attention to, or because there's not enough funding for it? Right. So uh, there may be ways in which we can uh, set up for future legislators to address the issue, even if there may not be a perfect model. Yeah. No, and I, I think your question's right on, and it also points out for me that we have this commission that that has potential benefits. Uh, to policy making because it is transparent, it meets in the public, it is televised, and um, and yet everything that happens in that forum could, under the current system, simply be ignored. Right, which is, would be a, uh, contradictory to the legislative intent and also a tremendous waste of time and money. Right. And uh, with that, uh, let me just say in regard um, to the... Uh, Warden Carno's remarks, uh, I don't have any direct questions for you. You've made your case uh, extremely well, and uh, I think it's, uh, and, and the uh, situation, uh, I certainly understand it fully. So I, it's only because you've made your case so well and uh, stated the problems that I, I don't have questions at this point. Well, I appreciate that. Ms. Yamada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks to all the panel members this morning, and I think I have uh, questions really more for Mr. McCammon and for uh, uh, Mr. Carno. Uh, thank you, uh, by the way. Last time I saw you, John, uh, we were talking about, uh, I guess I have 16,000 acres of the one million that you manage out at the Yola Wildlife Area, and I know the subject of uh, in lieu taxes and payments to local governments uh, when there are state acquisitions uh, is still somewhat hanging in the air. It is. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, something going forward that we still need to take a look at. Uh, but certainly we all share in, in the interest in preserving um, open space. Um, so uh, my question for you uh, is really uh, about DFG's uh, heightened role uh, since the Delta legislation uh, has uh, been chaptered. And I don't think it's a secret uh, in this room or amongst the committee members here that it wasn't exactly a kumbaya moment uh, for uh, those of us that actually represent the Delta. But having said that uh, and trying to be more positive uh, about all what occurred uh, last year, uh, do you feel that you have enough support and assistance uh, and communications mechanisms uh, with the local residents and uh, particularly the Delta counties uh, as we are uh, moving ahead uh, to implement? Uh, or do you foresee uh, uh, some additional uh, needs there? Yeah. Um, I know that uh, uh, outreach to the, to the Delta counties is, uh, has been increasing uh, over uh, time. Um, sec former Secretary Chrisman uh, spent a great deal of effort uh, inviting uh, uh, 
uh, Delta counties and uh, cities and other interest groups uh, in to make sure that they felt a part of the process. It's a very long and convoluted and complex process that I don't think we've adequately ensured that local governments are involved in. Um, and that's been recognized by the steering committee and they have asked specifically that our outreach folks spend more time uh, working with Delta communities. If you have additional uh, needs or desires in that regard, I'd be happy to try and fulfill them. And I, as I have said uh, in the past, you know, we certainly pledge our support and assistance uh, going ahead, although, again, just the in lieu tax issue, right. particularly for Yolo County, is already, um, you know, kind of prickly. Uh, for for some of my uh, uh, of my constituents, and so uh, we back to the sea urchins again. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and we'll get to the lobsters in a minute. Um, for uh, Mr. Carno, it's uh, very nice to meet you, and I believe I had a couple of your wardens uh, who will be unnamed that did stop by our office very early last year to raise these issues. You have indeed, as Mr. Ruskin said, made a very good case. Uh, we just want to make the reminder that it wasn't the legislature uh, that uh, wanted uh, this uh, one-size-fits-all approach uh, to, uh, you know, chopping state uh, services. And I think uh, if we can take that theme that uh, not all departments operate in the same way and that there are uh, ways in which resources can be uh, better used instead of, you know, the Conan the Barbarian one-size-fits-all all, uh, approach, uh, which I don't agree with. I think we have seen not only with DFG but with Employment Development Department, DMV, and others uh, that uh, when you take this kind of uh, a singular approach to how to deploy resources, uh, it does. It actually results in, in higher costs uh, in other ways. So um, we want to certainly um, support you on that. Uh, one quick question. Um, how do you, as an association, uh, interact with many, all the other law enforcement and public safety and fire safety um, uh, organizations in the state? In other words, do you have a regular conversation uh, with uh, other statewide organizations uh, that represent uh, law enforcement and public safety or, or uh, are you kind of, and I'm just looking at the organizational chart here, you know, as you are uh, part of this uh, bar here in the chart um, and, and here is your deputy director for law enforcement division. Uh, do you have conversations at the state level with other law enforcement um, agencies, unions, uh, et cetera? Uh, yeah, we do. I mean, on both levels. I mean, uh, first off is uh, just uh, uh, wardens themselves in the field, um, uh, myself, and I know a lot of wardens that, that are the only warden for entire counties end up being the only, uh, call it the Knights of the Round Table, um, that will be a uh, rank-and-file game warden sitting at the table with all the heads of state once a week or once a, a month with the elected sheriff, uh, the fire chiefs, the police chiefs, and discussing um, all law enforcement uh, and, and uh, um, uh, fire safety uh, issues. And I guarantee you <laughs> probably every meeting the I end up speaking or the warden ends up having more conversations <laughs> than any other agency just based on a lot of the, the issues that, that uh, we're involved in. It's kind of a, a bizarre situation, and, and I can um, understand this because I used to work for the Department of Forestry. Um, then it was changed, and this was in the 80s, and then it changed to Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Then it changed to CAL FIRE. And I remember I was a delegate in 1984 in Reading when the Southern California boys wanted to change it to CAL FIRE. And that has everything to do with image as far as what they do because uh, I worked mm -hmm. with CDF, and if you wore a green uniform as a firefighter and you showed up with a medical mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, uh, medical aid, uh, the public would go, well, who are you? Um, so that had to change, and that's what's happened to wardens as far as law enforcement. Uh, but as far as uh, coordination with uh, just law enforcement in the field and, and uh, with Nancy Foley, the, the chief of patrol, who has uh, uh, quite a uh, good interaction with uh, uh, police chiefs and sheriffs statewide and in other states, um, that that's it's on the department's level, and I've engaged in that. But as far as the warden association level, uh, th there there is a, and I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with the 
uh, process that's that's ongoing right now with the severance of all the peace officers from our current union uh, because 60 percent are non-sworn, 40 percent are sworn peace officers, all state peace officers, that's mm -hmm. DOJ special agents, the state park rangers, the uh, ABC, DMV investigators. Uh, we have um, two meetings every month for the last two years. We're pretty organized as far as the, having discussions with uh, those um, other law enforcement agencies and then also the local sheriff's department because everybody ha all, everybody's a, that has a cop has connections with all other cops. Okay. So we have been engaged um, significantly. In other words, when there is an incident, you're fully integrated into SIMS and MIMS incident uh, command I, I, and all of that. Yeah, the department knows more than I do as far as okay. that is concerned, but we are more so than ever before. And, and um, I, I know that uh, for th like the states of uh, Texas and Florida, uh, be, and it has a lot to do with the disaster response because the, the wardens, uh, and what it ends up happening is, is they respond to uh, these incidents and they're the only law enforcement entity that has a full wheel drive, that has bug spray, that has waiters 24-7. Mm -hmm. So you have these officers that are the best of the best responding to whatever the public needs are. You know, first and foremost, we're peace officers. We just happen to enforce the fishing game code. Right. Florida and Texas have figured it out such that they have, I believe Florida's, uh, Florida's up to 750 officers, and I think they only have less than half of the population in California. We only have a third of the, the same amount of officers they have in that state. Um, California needs to figure that out, and that's what we want to help do, and, and I, I think you recognize that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Ms. Caballero. Thank you very much. Uh, first, let me thank you all for your testimony here today. It was um, very illuminating, and I think um, the point was well taken in regards to the challenges of, of funding an organization that's doing some pretty complicated stuff and, and underfunding it, I guess. I, I, what I would like to do is talk a little bit about um, the fees and the fines. I, I mean, the, the yeah, the, the permit fees and the fines a little bit, as just because there were some recommendations made. and. Um, Mr. Carno, if I if I could, in regards to enforcement, could you give me your opinion? Um, it, once a warden has um, cited an individual and uh, they're to appear in court, I'm I'm assuming that because of the limited nature of of the the warden population, it's pretty impossible to arrest and take them down to the county jail. Um, so they're normally cites and they have to appear. Could you talk a little bit about? Um, what your opinion is in regards to how that case is then handled uh, and whether you think it's it's a satisfactory handle and I and I say that because I spent a lot of time in the court system I saw the difference between a misdemeanor um, uh, uh, poaching violation if you will or fish and game violation as opposed to any other misdemeanor and I, I can speak from from my county's perspective on what I saw uh, but we've now turned that whole process over to the counties to collect and I'm wondering if you have any information on any of that, that, that that's helpful, or if you don't, maybe we can get it from are the you administration. Are uh, maybe referring to some of the uh, uh, prosecution yes. of people that are poachers? Um, and I, I'll try to answer your question the best I can, and you can steer me in the right direction. I, and I think we're, I know where you're getting at. Um, each county, it was 58 counties. I've worked in a lot of different counties, and there's a lot of inconsistency. Even counties next to each other were, as an example, an individual may be cited for fishing without a license, which is an infraction, and have and uh, get a $700 fine. The neighboring county, you can arrest somebody and, and do a surveillance and catch somebody poaching deer at night, and they might get a $200 fine. It's unbelievable. And mm -hmm. so the warden, and this is a soapbox, I mean, a whole different issue that we could get on as far as, you know, the appropriateness of the justice system, and that happens across the board with all cops. Uh, but certainly with Fish and Game, there's there's those these two issues and one is this inconsistency in the justice system which which goes in as far as the uh, mindset uh, from the judges to the district attorney's office um, and then also there's the fact that uh, that certain people whether they consider wildlife crime crime mm -hmm. some counties it's it's uh, uh, you, you poach and it's a bad crime other counties it's they throw it in the trash so the wardens have to wrestle with that issue also. I mean, that's another thing I didn't even mention that adds to the stress. <laughs> but um, we do take, we do make uh, physical arrests every week statewide with only 200 boots on the ground. 
we are physically arresting people and taking them into custody, and, and we catch them when we clean them. Uh, we do pass them off um, to other agencies when, because our patrol vehicles are full drive, mm -hmm. and you just don't want the bad guy sitting next to you. You want to um, have uh, uh, somebody, you know, law enforcement agency that has a cage and put them in the back. Um, or if it's, you know, we pull somebody over for a, a DUI and uh, we get uh, the CHP to, uh, that's more their expertise than ours, to get more of a, uh, good evidence against the suspect, and then they'll take them into custody. So I hope that kind of answers part of it. I think Director McCammon wants to jump in on this. Yeah, You're probably going to point out, Director, that this committee helped pass a great bill last year I did. that <laughs> provides a little incentive for prosecutors to actually uh, take these cases because some of the penalty money comes back to them. But yeah, uh, and, and there is a, a split requirement. And one of the things I was going to point out that's an issue for us is uh, the ability to go out and audit actually what's going on in the counties. Yeah. Um, and we just we haven't been able to identify the resources to actually go out and do that, but we think that there's an apportionment issue going on in the counties uh, and kind of want to put counties on notice that we're intending to go look at that and make sure that we're collecting all that's due us. Well, and I appreciate that because when the state shifted its function <coughs> from collecting the fines and the forfeitures and made it a county responsibility, the county siphons off a fee right. in order to collect that um, the state didn't used to collect a fee, and I know that because as a as a city, the the, s the state used to collect. Right. As a m former mayor, the city used to collect. The um, the state did not collect that fee, and the county does now. And so it would be important to know, to be able to audit it is is important, but also to be able to figure out if there's a better way to do some of the prosecutions. Because my uh, analysis in in the counties that I appeared in is that the fish and game. Uh, violations were treated much different than any other misdemeanor violation. It was seen as less of a, of a crime, if you will, and m more of a hassle to prosecute. And, um, and so the fines were actually very low. And so if the fines are that low, we might as well institute them as, a, as an administrative process, for example, rather than um, there was never any jail time involved, as I recall, in the, in the cases that I saw. So anyway, I was just thinking out uh, on some of this. You, you have to set up an, a process to be able to have your day in court, but I'm wondering if now that we have the municipal court consolidated with the superior court, whether it makes sense to run all of these cases through the superior courts which also show up here and say we don't have the money, right. um, which is why they, they treat them, I think, a little bit differently. Just a, a, a thought, and I'm, I appreciate your comment in terms of the audit, and, and also the morale issue to the wardens out in the field to not see the kind of penalties that might be warranted in a case where they spent hours investigating and setting up sting operations or hiking you know, miles away from the roadway in order to be able to catch people. So. That, that was really my... Yeah, if I may, um, and, and you're right, I mean, game warden will crawl through the dirt, you know, to write a ticket sometimes, so. But anyways, uh, <laughs> the um, legislature did, and I, it was in early um, 2000s, I believe, changed it to where it made it more streamlined for wardens to direct file fishing cases, which a lot of the, our, our citations were, were fishing related. And and so that relieved a lot of, of, of uh, the... the the district attorney's office from reviewing the cases, we were able to direct file the case, and they went from the, they would they would go on the uniform the state uniform bail schedule and see you know if if you caught an over limit of trout, then this is what it would cost uh, to the defendant per trout over the limit, et cetera, and and that is working pretty well. And actually, I think some of those sections you could actually treat it as a uh, we call them wobblets, uh, uh, either an infraction or a misdemeanor. Right. And we're treating them as misdemeanors and actually getting more fi higher fines because they just go straight on the bail schedule, mm -hmm. and it worked. And it's been working out pretty good. And the legislature recognized that, you know, uh, uh, several years back. And then the Jared Huffman's bill 708, that that one, um, uh, you know, that that's new, and we're looking forward to catching some bad guys. That's good. <laughs> that's great. The other issue, um, and I and I, um, it really has to do with the. Um, the, the suggestion from the LAO's office that we uh, look at the possibility of having our, our, our permits or our um, the licensing uh, done in a way that's a little bit more streamlined, and I, I agree with that. I guess what I'm concerned about is, is transparency. A number of our stamps 
um, require a, an advisory committee. And I did have a bill last year where we were looking at more robust participation in the advisory committee process, but I'm wondering if it makes sense to um, change the way that that's done and not require it, that there be an advisory committee, but it go to the commission um, so that the commission is looking at the broad range of environmental um, improvements, if you will. This was the Bay Delta fish stamp, which was to po supposedly to, to improve the, um, the ecosystem for fish, whether the commission is really the place to do that. Because I, w what, what the fishermen wanted was transparency, and they wanted an opportunity to participate in the discussion and the analysis of what kinds of environmental um, enhancements you might do or, or reparations, if you will. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether that might be the way to, to resolve some of our issues that we had um, with how our bills changed over in the Senate um, that made us unhappy. And I think maybe Ms. Saldana may have the same kind of comment in regards to, to uh, her one of the bills that she had. Well, sure. Uh, there is one um, really good example that the commission has been working with the uh, duck stamp funding for many, many years. And the projects um, are, uh, there's a team with the department and some um, non-governmental organizations that rate the projects, put them together, do matching funding, but it comes to the commission for final approval and public vetting. And I think that's a success story that's been going on for many, many, many years. And it gives the public that chance to air it out um, and see where their money's going, see the benefits of that duck stamp money. I think that that model could be used for other other types of stamps. And, and Mr. Yeah, I just want to add uh, there are uh, 16 uh, uh, advisory committees right now advising the director on the distribution of some 50 specialized funds within the department. So it's a real complex kind of organization to manage. So, so would 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 your one of your recommendations might be that, that it be streamlined in a way to allow the commission to review it. And, and, I, and I say this because the, the, the fishermen came forward a number of years ago in the early 2000s and said, we want to tax ourselves in order to be able to create this, this uh, pool of money to be able to, uh, to, to create some solutions. And because of the disagreement over exactly how uh, the money should be used, the advisory commi com committee came back and said, we don't want this to right. continue. Right. And so I, I think it's a tragedy to disappoint a group of people who have voluntarily taxed themselves mm. and, uh, so much that they uh, they would let it lapse, the stamp lapse, and, and not pay it. Mm. So I'm, I'm looking for a solution here where we can continue to receive. We, we need money. And so I was not happy with eliminating it. As, an, as a resource, I'd like to be able to go back and say, let's figure out if there's another way to do this. I, I, I think a, a big piece of that involves a discussion about expectations that are developed when there's a self-imposed tax. And uh, that's the concern that I have, trying to manage this, these, those expectations and ensure that, that the level of expectation and the dollars have some connection with each other. And that just simply doesn't happen in most of these circumstances. Mm -hmm. well, and, and if I could, then it, it it, it seems to me then that it might be more appropriate to put the responsibility on a commission mm -hmm. that has a public process where you can talk about those expectations and, and, and vet them because I, I don't I, I understand where you're coming from. I, I don't think that the fishermen were being unreasonable. They just wanted to make sure that to the extent that they're contributing some kind of solution, number one, the money gets used for what it was supposed to, and number two, that it gets used. Mm. And and so, anyway, I, did, I appreciate your comment, and and I, I think we need to work towards a solution where we get some more money in. That's that's my goal. Mr. Carlson, were you indicating a desire to speak to some other part of that, or did you get well, the comment? Um, actually, what, just before that, uh, just a little backtrack to your concerns about fines and, and penalties. Um, the commission has had a few speakers over the last couple of years from the uh, circuit prosecutors, the district attorney association, and has worked with the department and sent some letters to the county district attorneys with their concerns about this also. And one thing that's come up quite often at our hearings is the lack of education to the county di district attorneys on the issues that we were just talking about, fish and game violations. And, and if there was a way to get some education to those counties to understand the importance, um, the commission is very supportive of that. And this circuit prosecutor program that the District Attorney Association has been using has had some success, but of course it needs some funding mm -hmm. and there's some problems there with the funding. But 
I think that uh, um, the commission is very concerned about that, not getting the education to the DAs. They don't understand the importance of these laws and, and the, the demeaning nature of low fines um, and uh, the message it sends to the crooks, really. Uh, Ms. Saldana. Thank you, and uh, yes, I do have questions on some legislation that I'm working on, but I, I, I want to make sure, and I think Assemblymember Caballero's comments go back to something we haven't used enough in this committee as a former member, and that is jobs. This is really about protecting jobs for people, because we have commercial fishermen whose livelihood depends on the department successfully managing the stocks of these fish or lobster or sea urchins or whatever it is we're talking about. So. Too often we get focused and, and people criticize us for caring more about animals than about people, but I, I think it is very important to make it clear that your responsibilities are essential to keep people employed, to keep these fisheries healthy, and we see what happens when they aren't healthy. So all, all that said, thank you for the work that you're doing and also for protecting against uh, poaching and people who are taking advantage of uh, a lack of, of our public safety officers in the field. And I represent San Diego and uh, a coastal district, uh, and, and it is a constant struggle because we have some very high value uh, lobsters. We used to have abalone when I was growing up. Um, and frankly, poaching it is a huge problem, and I, I would like to find a way to fully fund what we need for protecting our resources from people who think it's, it's okay to steal because they're not only stealing uh, from the residents of California, they're stealing from, again, commercial, legally operating um, fisheries people whose jobs and livelihoods that they've invested in depend on those things. So I think it's important that we make that point because too often this committee gets labeled as caring more for other things and not about people, but it's, it's absolutely integrated. And, and to that end, I, I know that the advisory committees are very important to the process of establishing a fisheries management plan. Um, and I did have a, a meeting with uh, the director in my office last week, and I asked about some of these advisory committees because I, I'm working on legislation to establish one using, again, a, a voluntary payment method that the lobster fishermen have proposed doing. You said at the time you weren't sure, but now we've, you, you sent me a memo that there are 16 advisory committees. Um, is there a process to sunset committees? Uh, because I, I've looked back over many that have been established. Um, I, I see that the squid fishery is the last fishery management plan that was developed, and yet their advisory committee was never established uh, as part of that process. So I'm curious if, if there is a sunset mechanism to ensure that these, these committees uh, don't simply stay on the books and require person hours uh, throughout the year to maintain. So can you it, let us know how that occurs? Yeah, it depends on it, each one of these has a separate statutory authorization, and that in sometimes within those statutory authorizations, the legislature does have sunset mechanisms, others do not. And do you think it would be more cost effective to just have everything sunset until and unless it's determined that it, it needs to continue? Um, I think generally yes, but I, I'm just trying to, I'm wondering if there's occasions when we don't want to do that. As an example, hunter education is an ongoing function forever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and w is kind of one of our core mission issues. Mm -hmm. So we really don't need a sunset in that instance, but on the other hand, there may be a number of these where they, that would be appropriate. So, so Mr. Chairman, something yeah. that you might look at in terms of some cost savings on that. Yeah, and, and a sunset review is, of course, part of the reform package that the legislature has been looking at. Uh, so uh, that's and a good point. Uh, re and also related to that, uh, I was surprised but pleased to hear that there were over 44,000 views on the hearings that were taking place. If only we had a pay-per-view program, <laughs> uh, maybe we could <laughs> come up with some kind of funding source. Um, but I think it reflects the goodwill that California residents generally have towards our efforts. They're, they're engaged, they're curious, and I'm wondering if anyone has, has looked at how we can take that engagement and translate it into some support. You know, we, we have a bonds measure coming forward on state parks, but is, uh, and I, I don't recall, who was it that brought up the 44,000 views? You, you made that comment? Yeah. So yeah, and I have to say that was a, a that was a, single a, a rare highlight. Yeah. I mean, we do get thousands um, depending on our meetings, but 44 was like a, 
the top of all the posts in the central yeah, post yeah. NLPS. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great point. But it's still there's a, there's been a significant increase in the viewership and the uh, the outreach from that. And given that we now have that technology and people are clearly using it, so is the old cost associated with advisory committees where people would physically travel to places to meet? Is some of those costs can they be conserved by by doing more teleconferencing, doing more work online, instead of, of paying for the physical costs and hosting of meetings? Is there some cost savings that could be derived by looking at things that way? Uh, yeah, uh, certainly that is a. Uh, um something we're all doing I think in state government trying to figure that out but uh, a lot of it takes investment in infrastructure that, that we don't have um, for uh, teleconferencing and so forth and th that investment's not insubstantial so well and that leads that's, where was, that's a good segue because um, again we don't want to think of ourselves isolated in a bubble I taught IT in the community colleges before we have teleconferencing capabilities on most of our campuses those are state programs if there is time available in a classroom somewhere that has a teleconferencing capability and we invite in people on advisory committees around the state to go to a community college, then maybe we can be saving on some of these costs and using existing state resources. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that we are, and <coughs> I know uh, Assemblymember Caballero and I both have been approached by, by uh, again, people that are committed to the state succeeding, your program succeeding, they want to voluntarily pay for that success, and yet we're turning them away because we're saying the overhead and the costs are too high. So what I would like to continue to engage in is how we can look in within the department and see where some of those costs could be managed more f efficiently, uh, whether it's sunsetting, using other resources, uh, but people's livelihoods and jobs depend on this. And we look at the amount of lobsters that are caught and in terms of weight, but then we look at the value of what that means. And it, I mean, I, I appreciate that you're now making them a priority stock and that you are putting resources into that. I think more could come in through the passage of this bill I'm working on. Um, but it, it really does come down to some really basic, uh, I think, thinking outside the box. And we, we've already gone down the path of, of coming up with some private funds to pay for these things. So the next question is, as we continue those partnerships, how can we be smarter and use other resources that the state has available? It doesn't have to be. I would never propose creating a teleconferencing capability just for your department. It already exists and it's available, I believe, for you to use. It's simply a matter of identifying it and using it appropriately. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruskin has one last question and we're just about done with this panel, so we'll keep, we'll get moving here. I forgot to ask you a question about in terms of the governor's proposed uh, reduction of five million for uh, hunting, fishing, land management. Uh, will that uh, affect any federal funds, federal matching funds? Um, yes, there are federal funds in the hunting, fishing, land management function. Uh, our priorities uh, as we go through that planning process to try and identify how we're gonna accommodate that reduction are twofold. One is to not reduce the number of hunting days available to our constituents that pay the bills for us. Uh, and secondly, is not to affect match on federal funds. We are concerned that we're not gonna be able to accomplish that second one. So it's it's not resolved yet, but that is an issue out there. Maybe we could uh, stay in touch in that regard. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Last uh, question, and then you're all, uh, and thanks for your patience, everyone. Uh, I've gotta ask you about online licenses because uh, we've been talking a lot today about yeah. doing more with less, about efficiencies, about the, the, the future, and uh, of course selling more licenses, making it easier to get a license would be uh, a smart thing to do. I can get a ticket on an airplane uh, online, but I can't get a fishing license, and I have to assume it's the same way with hunting licenses, and in fact, sometimes getting a fishing license is uh, you know, practically a scavenger hunt. Uh, you've got some folks that won't even sell certain stamps because it's just uh, not advantageous to them. I, I've had to go to multiple places to get a steelhead stamp uh, at various times. But it seems like something that would be very, very simple to set up to just do online at any hour of the night and day. It would save the department money. It would bring in more revenue. And we've been talking about it for a long time. C can we make this happen yesterday, please? Y it did. I just <laughs> I, I want to assure you it did. As of May 26th, my birthday, okay. uh, online licenses are available. Uh, la last May 26th, okay. you can buy fishing licenses, which are about 70% of the sales that we have, okay. and the related stamps online. There's a button on the DFG website that says 
fishing licenses online. And now, uh, we do have a project called the Automated License Data System, which was started, I think, the first time in 1985, to tell you the truth. But it is, uh, we are anticipating having uh, the remainder of our licenses uh, online, uh, uh, most of them towards the end of this year, and then uh, over 2011, we're gonna try and put the entire packaging of licenses uh, online over the next two years. Right. But fishing licenses, the biggest piece of it, is online today. That's good news. Thank you, Director McCammon. And thank you to everyone on the panel. And let me welcome up uh, now panel number two. So we, we've spent quite a bit of time, um, and I think appropriately so, talking about the department's broad mission and responsibilities. Now we're going to move to the second uh, piece of that performance-based budgeting inquiry, which is how are we doing? And so we have a a, a very esteemed panel of experts uh, with a, a variety of backgrounds that are going to opine on how the department is doing in satisfying its mission and mandates. Because we took so long with panel one, I'm going to ask the panelists in panel two. Hi, Frank. Great to see you. I'm going to ask the panelists on this panel to try to limit their uh, opening remarks to four minutes. I know that's asking a lot, uh, but we're going to try to wrap this panel up and then break for lunch before we come back for our third panel. So uh, with that, I think Dr. Peter Moyle is uh, up first. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. Do we have a remote gracious to say hello for the uh, – do we have a remote uh, for the PowerPoint? Yeah. So first we have to get it loaded up. I, I'm not sure I actually need the PowerPoint, Fred? but – are you allowed um, to sit here with us? Especially with four minutes. Uh, um, and, and again, uh, to all the witnesses, we if you prepared testimony regarding the department's mission, I think we've probably exhausted that. We, we got it. Uh, we want to hear from you how we're doing uh, in meeting that mission. Right. And so what I want to do is to um, talk about freshwater fish, that's what I work with. I've been working on the freshwater fish of the California since 1969, usually working with Department of Fish and Game people, uh, and to, of course training lots of students who wind up being fish and game biologists and wardens. Um, and so what I want to do though is give three examples of uh, that demonstrate the, where the department really does not have the, the personnel or resources to do their job. Um, and these examples come from looking at the status of California fishes, which is a project which is funded by the Department of Fish and Game, at least in part, evaluating this. Uh, uh, the results are just in. Uh, likewise, a study of the Yale River funded by Cal Trout. Um, and then finally, the, something on the use of 5937 of the Fish and Game Code, which I'm very familiar with. First off, just to remind you, California is this really diverse state with a really diverse fish fauna. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, it's highly endemic fauna. Uh, roughly 80% of the fishes are found no place else or maybe shared with Oregon and Nevada. So we have a, it's our responsibility. This is, these are our fish. Nobody else will take care of them for us. 73% of these fish are in serious decline. 23% are listed. Uh, this report uh, we've just finished, um, we, list, we recommend listing for another 22%. That's almost half the fish fauna of California uh, is, on the, is headed towards extinction. Um, and th this has been uh, going on for some time. All you have to do is look at uh, this, this uh, the, the reports uh, that I've done on the status of California's fish fauna in 89, 95, and, 2000 and, th and this year, 2009, actually 2010, it just came out or just submitted. Um, the number of listed species has gone from 13 to 28, and the percentage of species in serious trouble has gone from 53% to 75%. That, that's 20 years. Part of that's better information, but also it, that's <coughs> being something to say about the fish fauna itself. <coughs> we know extinction happens. Uh, Thick-tailed chub disappeared in 57. That picture of the bull trout is the second to last one caught in California. My graduate went in the 70s. One of my graduate students caught the last one. Um, the, these delta smelt uh, and the coho salmon are both on the verge of extinction in the state. Those are the next two species that are likely to go. Uh, so fish fauna overall is not in great shape. We're talking about major declines. That's, that's a statewide issue. But it includes important fish, 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 fish that we like to fish for, like coho salmon and steelhead. Uh, well, here's the Eel River. 
Now, this is a, a focusing in on one watershed, third largest watershed in, in California. Uh, I just finished this report for, for Cal Trout uh, on the status of, of, of anadromous fish in, in, the, in the Eel River. Uh, and uh, the basic question, they want to know what's going on. This is also funded by the Friends of the Eel River. Um, and you have to recognize that the Eel River, if you look back as, as this wonderful um, uh, movie does, it just came out last year, uh, was once one of the best steelhead streams, steelhead and salmon fishing streams in the United States. It was had tremendously hard regard. It was publicized in all the major fishing magazines. And that was difficult to get to then. People made, especially from the Bay Area, meant took major treks up there to participate in this just amazing fishery. Um, that's no longer. Um, the historic abundance of, we estimated the historic abundance of salmon, steelhead, combined was somewhere between 500,000 and a million salmon per year in the 19th century and up into the early 20th century. <coughs> the present abundance, there are 3,500 fish coming up that river every year. That's combined Chinook salmon, coho salmon, and steelhead. Uh, that's a 99.7% decline. Uh, and the coho are probably going to disappear in the very near future, as are uh, 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 summer steelhead. I also like to point out that this, in, this, y this, I think these numbers are real, but our information is very poor because nobody's out there looking. Nobody's paying any attention to this really major uh, river system. There are some fishing game biologists out there, but they're just overwhelmed. Uh, they just don't have the time to deal with this. Um, the final thing. I wanted to mention was section 5937 of the Fish and Game Code because this is a section of the Fish and Game Code that if enforced to do a lot of good statewide in terms of improving fisheries. Um, and it's, it's been characterized by uh, legal types who've looked at a statute closely as one of the clearest statutes in California law practically. It just says if you own a dam, you're responsible for the fish below that dam and you've got to maintain fish in, in quote unquote good condition. Um, this statute was, has been used a couple of times very successfully, including restoring the, the San Joaquin River, which is the meeting I'm going to be heading to right after this. We're getting the flows back to the San Joaquin in order to restore spring run Chinook salmon. Uh, prior, uh, but it's just, you know, this is a lawsuit that Mr. Huffman was involved in. Uh, it took us, uh, you know, they, they dried up the river in the 1940s. It took until now to get this river back. And that was using... The lawsuit only went on for 20 years. Yeah. I was <coughs> worked as an expert witness for 20 years on that. <coughs> and Section 50, 5937 was the basis of the lawsuit. The ironic thing, thing is that the Department of Fishing and Game was not really involved, uh, not in any substantial way. And they have not been in using this, this really very powerful statute. And I've, I've been involved in some other cases now, too, where that are similar. Uh, and this is a, a, a statute that, that, with aggressive application, could have huge benefits to fish, such as uh, one of the, the areas you can do the most for the, sh for the Klamath River, for example, is restoring the Shasta River. And part of that restoration project has to be dealing with getting better flows uh, out of this dam. That could be done with aggressive application. At the present time, when 5937 is applied, it's typically done by somebody else. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, using that saying the laws on the books enforce it rarely is the fish department of Michigan actually involved I don't think it's, it's not, I don't really blame them because it's it's this is a hard thing to do but nevertheless it's an example of where the Department of Fish and Game could be doing a lot more if they had the staff and funds uh, to do so mm -hmm. so the basic what I want the message I want to leave you with is that aquatic resources are in really poor condition in California. We're losing in all these endemic species that occur in no place else. We're losing fisheries, as w was pointed out. Major fisheries are shut down. The salmon fishing industry is going by the wayside. Uh, we're losing all kinds of ecosystem services because when you have fish, endemic fish and fisheries, you have clean, clean cold water flowing into our rivers. Um, and I'm, I'm afraid the Department of Fishing and Game has been unable to do much more than just slow the rate of loss. They haven't been able to stop this stuff. Can you imagine having a, having a river like the Eel where you got 99.7% <coughs> loss of extraordinarily valuable, valuable fish that used to go up in the hundreds of thousands? That just seems uh, unreal that we've allowed that to happen. And nobody seems to know about it, by the way, either. Uh, I think in part of this, the fish Department of Fishing Game has the tools, but is really not allowed to use them. I think that's part of the big problem. So thank you. Is that four minutes? Hey, you did a great job. You <laughs> sped it right up. <laughs>
and, uh, and a very interesting case study on 5937 because I think the department in 1950, if I'm not mistaken, tried to bring a, 19, uh, a 5937 action and Governor Pat Brown pulled them back and That's prevented right. them from doing it. And they that has sort of been the, the uh, that's been the playbook ever since. You're right. Absolutely. So, <laughs> great. Uh, we're going to now hear from Fred Keeley. Welcome back. Uh, former Assembly Member Keeley, great to see you again. Mr. Chairman, thank you very the much. Author of the Marine Life Management Act. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members. It's a privilege to be back uh, with you and uh, to provide some testimony. Um, I will be uh, undoubtedly the um, uh, least authoritative person who will testify in front of your committee today um, because the rest of the folks are uh, scientists and uh, department heads and uh, folks of great accomplishment and, and an awful lot of knowledge. Uh, but I would like to, uh, perhaps in the marine environment, uh, take a couple of uh, legislative minutes to be able to set the stage here. Think about where we were in 1996. Where we were was that in the marine environment we had a 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s architecture for managing in the marine environment. And because the Department of Fish and Game and the Fish and Game Commission were very first parts of the California Constitution and the California set of laws and statutes, it meant that the what Fish and Game was managing towards in the marine environment was very different than where we were at in 1996. Where we were at in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s was that you were managing abundance. And because of that, it meant that the statutes that were built to manage abundance said that you didn't manage much at all unless you were in a crisis. Mm -hmm. Now that's when California was basically rural, agricultural, and sparsely populated, and that policy made sense then. Now move, that, that is the policy for 100 years, 130 years. Now we sit there in 1996. The state has become something other than basically rural, basically ag agricultural, and basically sparsely populated. It is very, very different. You have some 35 million Californians, about 70 percent of whom live it within a one hour's drive of the coast, placing enormous pressures on the coastal waters, which are a public trust resource for which you all and the executive branch have an obligation to protect those public trust resources within the first three miles out. So what uh, was able to happen over a two-year period was that with the assistance of Dave Bunn, who was at that time legislative director in my office, uh, we were able to work with uh, hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders all over the state of California and with the administration of then Governor Pete Wilson to write and have the governor sign the Marine Life Management Act. And the intent of that was really to change things very dramatically. It was to say that instead of managing abundance, we know that the world we're in now is managing scarcity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the notion of not managing much until you're in crisis is a prescription for a serial killing species by species. So to modernize that, the idea was to establish sustainability as our objective in managing in the marine environment in California to say, how do you do that? You do that through good, sound, iterative science. You do that by having stakeholders have literally a place at the table in the development of individual fishery management plans, adopted not by the legislature, but by the Fish and Game Commission. And uh, I just might say parenthetically that one of the issues back and forth here about the Fish and Game Commission relative to other commissions is certainly to keep in mind that they are established in the Constitution. So to change anything relative to the Fish and Game Commission is a constitutional issue. Uh, you're, you're suggesting then that the statute, that the, the mere statute that would attempt to limit their uh, authority is uh, trumped by the uh, foundational uh, 
law of the, that created them? Um, I will tell you this, that there are people on this panel and others who are lawyers and, and, and I am not and better able to answer that question. I can tell you that when Mr. Bunn and I were working on, the, uh, on, on authoring and having Governor Wilson enact, uh, sign into law the Marine Life Management Act, uh, the answer to your question, I believe, would have been yes. Um, <laughs> now, so we got, we've got the Marine Life Management Act. The next year, uh, Assembly Member, then Assembly Member Shelley, former Secretary of State Kevin Shelley, authors, and I principal co-author, the Marine Life Protection Act. Now, the architecture of that act is to say, let's modernize the tools for governance now that we have changed, completely changed what it is we're managing towards, how we are going to do that, let's make sure that the tools for managing towards sustainability are as robust and as modern as this new public policy. Keep in mind, the Marine Life Management Act was the last bill Pete Wilson signed into law as governor. He kept putting it on his desk, off his desk. Jackie Schaefer, then the director of the Department of Fish and Game, would put it on his desk and he'd say, I'm not ready for that yet. And uh, it went on all night long and, and it was in fact the last law that he signed uh, uh, into law, the Marine Life Management Act. The Marine Life Protection Act was really for uh, for examining based largely on Deborah McArdle's good work at um, at Sea Grant to be able to look at whether or not the uh, existing uh, marine protected area strategy was in fact a meaningful act uh, every time one of these was established did it mean anything was anyone in fact enforcing those and I think the short version of a very excellent report that I commend to you that she authored is that the answer was no and so what needed to happen is to modernize that tool to uh, create a process as well as modernizing the tool, modernize the process for developing marine protected areas so that they weren't uh, small individual acts with no particular overriding coherence to them. So the Marine Life Protection Act did that. It added that overall strategic approach uh, for uh, implementing, uh, in part, the Marine Life Management Act. The individual efforts to develop those marine protected areas so that what you would have is a link of those from the Oregon border to the Mexican border along the California coast uh, was a very thoughtful, I think, and very positive relationship between the governor, the legislature, whoever they happen to be. Now, I will say that it is an underfunded effort then. It was an underfunded effort in the interim, and it's an underfunded effort now. But for folks like Resources Legacy Fund and others who, who step to the plate with, with, with essentially private funds to be able to assist in that effort, I'm not sure it would be anywhere near where it is now. But I think that that was very, very important work that was done. Now, add to that, so we've got the Marine Life Management Act changing the policy, Marine Life Protection Act modernizing the tools. Then you've got a couple of smaller activities. I would, I think they're smaller, but equally as important now when added into the overall mix. You've got the Ocean Protection Council, mm -hmm. which now not only says here's what we're managing towards in the marine environment and lifts significant portions of their mission from the Marine Life Management Act and the Marine Life Pe Protection Act, but also does so on a Washington, Oregon, California basis, so that all three states within their coastal waters have got some continuity to management objectives and outcome-based management as well. Add to that a very small piece which was the enactment of the California Ocean Science Trust Act, which is essentially the, the science component to the Ocean Protection Council, with their goal being, among others, but primarily undertaking the development and implementation of the monitoring enterprise of the marine protected areas and the Marine Life Management Act and the Marine Life Protection Act. So think of where we are now. We went for 130 years without much change at all in how we managed. We made massive changes in 1997, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. The current administration uh, works with the, uh, I think quite effectively, uh, with the Ocean Protection Council. 
The, the shortcoming I would point to is the lack of a permanent dedicated funding source. You have on the last page of, your, uh, of, uh, of the document that you handed out, Mr. Chairman, a range of options in that regard. I, I prefer two or three over two or three others. Maybe that's not as important which I prefer, or which uh, certainly not which I prefer is important, but, but that the, the Second absolutely. Second for the LEOs, uh, recommended. Uh, here the on the back, material. yes, yeah. uh, on, on page six, it right. talks about, and, uh, if you're at all interested, I, I do think what former Assembly Member John Laird has suggested uh, uh, is an outstanding uh, recommendation. I also think that if there was a de minimis fee on all recordations on real property, I don't think that that is too far a stretch in terms of linking a fee uh, with a direct benefit. Uh, uh, but without sinking into the details of that, to say simply that uh, with regard to how is it going, it's going moderately well. The, there are marine protected areas now established uh, in the central coast where I live in the uh, People's Republic of Santa Cruz. Uh, we've got uh, uh, off the coast of uh, the central coast there. 204 square miles. I think it is about 20 or 25 marine protected areas. Those were the first that were adopted through this process. It was a, it was a process with a couple of false starts and then a very, very good finish to it. Um, and 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 I think that as 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 the department and 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 the commission has moved up and down the coast uh, since then, uh, it's all also been quite good product. I think that, that universally uh, what observers of this would, would point to is the lack of ability to enforce. And, that, uh, and whether that is at the Fish and Game Warden level, as the gentleman pointed out who previously testified, uh, or it is a somewhat broader architecture of enforcement and, and the ability of the department or the resources agency to really fulfill these statutory obligations, uh, I think it does come down to a permanent dedicated funding source and not being subject to the vagaries of the thin line of general fund money that goes to those entities, but instead be able to lock in in the same way we do in some other areas that are very high priorities for us in the state of California, a permanent dedicated funding source that has some flexibility to it. I was talking to, uh, and this will be my last comment, Mr. Chairman, I was, I was talking to some folks uh, earlier who said, my goodness, there are so many individual uh, dedicated little fees and slices right. that the department has, and uh, is that really good? It's very good in the absence of a permanent dedicated <laughs> funding source because you need to protect every penny you can. Yeah. Uh, but I do think that that's the direction I would, I would encourage you to go. I don't think there's a lack of will in either the legislative or executive branch or in the nonprofit communities or the stakeholder communities to make this work. I think what there is is a lack of a permanent dedicated funding source. Mr. Chairman and members, so kind of you to allow me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, observations. We appreciate it. So we're going to go now to uh, Dr. Rick Frank. It's not fair uh, for me to ask him to present so quickly and also introduce himself. So let me just tell you that after a, an incredible career at the Attorney General's office uh, uh, where he gathered uh, probably an unmatched uh, expertise in natural resource protection law in the state of California. He now heads the UC Berkeley Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment. So welcome, Dr. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I've been asked to speak briefly about the uh, Department of Fish and Game's uh, public trust-related responsibilities and, and to talk <coughs> briefly about how well uh, it's accomplishing those objectives. Uh, so let me uh, jump into that uh, quickly. Again, very uh, generally, the public trust doctrine, or a cornerstone of California environmental law and policy, provides that certain natural resources that are owned by the state of California in a special status uh, for the benefit of its citizens and for future generations. And it also imposes an affirmative obligation on government officials in all three branches of government, uh, namely that they have an affirmative and ongoing duty to safeguard the long-term preservation and well-being of those public trust resources uh, on behalf of the public. Uh, the public trust doctrine is, is contained in the California Constitution. For example, it's little known fact that the members of the public have a constitutional right to fish from public lands in the state. It's contained in California statutes where the legislature has talked generally about the public trust nature of uh, fish and wildlife resources. That, that doesn't include a right to catch, though. Uh, no, no, that, that, that is left to the individual level, uh, skill level involved. 
and the courts have weighed in periodically, and it's uh, well established uh, going back to the 19th century. Um, it's important to, to, again, it's a long-standing principle of, of public trust law that the public trust doctrine applies fully to fish, to wildlife, and, and again, something that hasn't been emphasized too much in this, in this hearing to date, the habitat upon California fish and wildlife resources uh, rely. And interestingly, just a couple years ago, there was a frontal assault by some development interests on the applicability of the public trust doctrine mm -hmm. to fish and wildlife resources, which was forcefully and uh, unambiguously rejected by the California Supreme Court in 2008 in the Epic versus Department of Forestry uh, uh, decision. There, there are numerous instances and programs where the department has what I would consider uh, uh, public trust-related administrative and regulatory and planning responsibilities. Sometimes, as has been mentioned, these responsibilities are shared with the Fish and Game Commission. Uh, I'm not going to talk generally about these because most of them have been touched on by previous uh, witnesses. Um, one, again, I, I see this as a public trust uh, uh, responsibility outside the Fish and Game Code. Uh, the department has been designated by the legislature and by the California Natural Resource Agency as a trustee agency over fish and wildlife with particular expertise and responsibilities under what I would characterize as California's most single most important environmental law, the California Environmental uh, Quality Act. And as you have mentioned yourself, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the legislature through the Delta legislation and specifically SB1X, uh, the, uh, the legislature has recently conferred new substantial public trust related responsibilities on the Department of Fish and Game mm -hmm. uh, related to, among other things, the establishment of uh, Delta flow criteria. Um, and then there's mm -hmm. the Bay Delta Conservation Plan and ongoing responsibilities under the Forest Practices Act. So the department has broad public uh, trust related responsibilities, not just limited to the Fish and Game Code, but a wide array of California uh, law. Let me briefly touch on two challenges which the courts have provided, one to the legislature and one to the department with respect to those public trust responsibilities. In the same EPIC decision, uh, the California Supreme Court uh, indicated that when it comes to the public trust doctrine as it applies to fish and wildlife resources, it's going to primarily look uh, not to the development of the common law to court decisions, but to the legislature and what the legislature concludes is appropriate in terms of those p uh, 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 describing, setting, uh, and tasking the department with those public trust responsibilities. The other thing uh, uh, another important responsibility which the courts have also about a year and a half ago imposed explicitly on the department relates to uh, third-party litigation that is brought on or under any number of these laws, the California Endangered Species Act, uh, the, the laws that, that Mr. Keeley has been testifying about and others, even where uh, environmental groups, citizens groups believe that it is private actors or development interests that are compromising or contravening uh, those provisions, uh, uh, the, the Court of Appeal in San Francisco recently has held in the decision I've mentioned, C Citizens for Center for Biological Diversity versus FPL Group, uh, that the Department of Fish and Game must be named as a party in, in those cases. That's going to present additional challenges, additional uh, mm -hmm. uh, demands on the expertise and time and staffing of the department to respond to those third party lawsuits where the public trustee role of the commission, uh, the, the department is brought into, uh, uh, brought into question. Uh, in terms of assessing the Department of Fish and Games record and as a steward of the public trust, I, I, it would come as no surprise, I'm sure, that in my view at least, that record is extremely uneven. Let me give you an example of one context in which I think the department has, has performed exceedingly well uh, and another uh, not terribly well at all. The first relates to oil spill prevention and response. In response to a major oil spill in this state or off the waters of the state about 20 years ago, the legislature adopted a, a, a new statute, enacted a statute, the uh, Lempert Sea Strand uh, Oil Spill uh, Prevention and Recovery Act that actually has worked extremely well and empowered mm -hmm. Uh, the department uh, to give it a whole set of new responsibilities in that regard uh, and gave it a dedicated funding, uh, spend, uh, funding mm -hmm. source as a result of a, a small surcharge on, on petroleum products <laughs> being marketed and processed through the state. Mm -hmm. That is a program which the department, I think, uh, embraced uh, aggressively, staffed it well, and uh, I think as a result of that visionary legislation and the thoughtful implementation by the department, uh, the state of California and its public trust resources are much better off. and the 
Department is doing, I think, an excellent job in conjunction with other agencies that have responsibilities under that legislation, like the State Lands Commission, uh, to both prevent oil spills and when they do occur to address them and respond to them and remediate them uh, very effectively. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, I would simply, in the interest of time, underscore and reiterate what uh, Professor Moyle has already mentioned with respect to Fish and Game Code Section 5937. And, and as the, the, the token lawyer on the panel here, I agree with uh, Professor Moyle that, you know, the, the, the language of that statute, which is nearly a century old, seems quite unambiguous and straightforward. It has not been, by and large, implemented, observed, uh, or enforced. Uh, and that is unfortunate, and I think what you see is uh, the results of uh, the testimony and the, the, uh, the information provided by Professor Moyle and others. Um, mm -hmm. With respect to, and I haven't really gone through, oops, through my, uh, in terms of reforms that would address this, again, I, I, mm -hmm. I would reiterate uh, the, the need for more funding, more stable funding, and uh, uh, I wouldn't characterize the, the recent funding pattern as a pattern of, of boom or bust. It's been bust or a larger bust, really, <laughs> uh, in relation to the uh, increasing number of burdens, obligations, and programs that have been imposed upon mm -hmm. the department. Um, and again, I, in preparing for this testimony, I actually came across for the first time the legislation that uh, the director and others uh, identified. It's really an extraordinary statute. You don't normally see codified legislation where the legislature admits and acknowledges that the funding that they have provided over the years is totally inadequate to uh, address the public trust responsibilities and resources. But the two sections, uh, 710, 711, uh, say that in, in just such terms. So in addition to st uh, more funding, more staffing, uh, I, I, my research indicated about 2,000 fish and game employees. The director says 2,100, so I'm happy to go with his figure. Uh, it's interesting that that thin green line consists of only 385 wardens, of whom I'm under, I understand less than half are in the field at any particular time. The rest uh, are largely desk bound, and there was a a reference to the fact that uh, redeployment or reallocation of those resources might be appropriate. Uh, like another important regulatory agency over which this committee has jurisdiction, the Coastal Commission, the, uh, the Department of Fish and Game really lacks uh, a strong planning component and function, doesn't have the staff or the budget for that. It's also interesting that uh, there are more fishery biologists employed by the Department of Water Resources than by the Department of Fish and Game. Uh, that seems uh, an interesting mm -hmm. fact and statistic. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of, uh, I think there's a generally acknowledged need for more autonomy and authority uh, by the department. Uh, some have argued with some uh, uh, persuasiveness, I think, that there's a, a lack of a strong core constituency supporting the department in its political and budgetary battles. Uh, uh, traditional constituents like hunters and fisher, fishermen and women uh, have not really flocked to the support. And there's also a, a well um, well-articulated view that in many ways within state government, both within the uh, uh, Natural Resources Agency and within uh, the executive branch generally, the department is often in the political battles and fray a, a bit of a stepchild or often shunted aside in favor of other departments uh, and interests. Uh, and finally, the issue of environmental governance uh, for the department. This is an issue that this committee spent a lot of time on in context of the Delta last year. Uh, I can't, uh, I'm not in a position to, to argue in favor of a director model versus a commission model. I would suggest that in many ways, I think the current uh, combination maybe, uh, maybe combines the worst attributes of both uh, and as well as the best. Uh, and I would suggest that uh, uh, the the uh, uh, working relationship of the commission and the department should not have to function on the respective personalities or with all due respect to the executive director of the commission how often they play golf together right. but mm -hmm. uh, uh, a more uh, uh, a more thoughtful institutionalized working relationship I think would really redound to the benefit of the public trust resources that both the commission and the department are charged with protecting. Happy to answer any questions that you or the other committee members may have. Terrific. We will have some questions, but uh, first we're going to go to uh, David Bunn from uh, the UC Davis Wildlife Health Center. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, thank you for having me to present a few ideas here today. Um, between 2002 and 2005, uh, it was federally mandated that all 50 states do an assessment of what uh, they call the stressors are causing the decline of species in each state in the nation. And then what are the key things that need to occur to uh, prevent that continued decline? 
Um, and the kind of the thinking behind that was, you know, kind of the Endangered Species Act is too late, and we we just assume more species don't get listed. So in California, working closely with Department of Fish and Game, they chose they contracted the University of California Wildlife Health Center to manage uh, doing that three-year uh, study and. Um, I'm only going to highlight a couple points, uh, what I would consider probably the most important points of the, of the report. Um, doesn't matter which part of the state you look in, the number one problem facing wildlife on a broad level is growth and development. You know, California is the most biodiverse state in the nation, far and away, but we also have the highest growth pressures. So as you know, there's a conflict there that's, that's enormous, and I would argue that our state probably has essentially greater challenges than most states in terms of trying to preserve species and habitats over time. So among a number of other things that were listed, and you can imagine what the others were, but um, I'll just focus on one, that that major impact is growth and development around the state. Probably the only place in the state, frankly, that's not yet a huge issue is in the Modoc Plateau, but ju that's just a matter of time. But, um, but along with that, Destruction, uh, you know, destruction of habitat, fragmentation, degradation of habitat. Uh, the other thing we discovered is probably the most critical habitat in the terrestrial world, I mean the non-marine world, is riparian habitats. That these are the habitats, uh, and riparian meaning those areas along rivers, streams, around lakes, are the areas that really support the broad biodiversity in the state. So for example, if you take a look at the Mojave Desert, there's not a lot of water, but the water that's there is very critical for maintaining species. And there's issues there, for example, the, the overdraft of groundwater, Mojave River Basin, is basically causing that riparian corridor to dry up. So I can point to similar examples, many, many examples, in every part of the state with regard to this very, very important habitat. So how do we move forward and try and turn this around? Well, it requires planning. I mean, we, you know, we have a, a, a state government that's well set up to do planning. We have local governments to do planning. But um, the report kind of concluded two primary things. One is that we have a, a law in California called the Natural Community Conservation Planning Act. And that act has had some enormous successes, although it's very difficult to implement. But um, that's one of the key things. That, like, we need to really strengthen and rebuild the Department of Fish and Game's capacity to assist counties with technical assistance and, uh, and public process assistance to uh, develop these large-scale conservation plans uh, across the state. Uh, around, 19, around 2001, you know, the, I think the department had done a huge amount of work, had had a lot of counties after talking to them for many, many years, lined up to start this process, and then the state budget went south, and pretty much all that kind of went on hold. And, and uh, Fish and Game staff declined. I think right now they may have between 8 and 12 conservation planners. Uh, back then, there was a bill in the legislature, which the legislature passed and went to the governor. We had estimated at, to even do a, a reasonable job to help counties, they would need 74 conservation planners. That bill, by the way, went to the governor's desk and was vetoed. But, um, but so going forward is that the one thing, if we're gonna really going to save habitat, you need to plan for it. I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can have growth and development, and we can lose all kinds of species. But if we have planned efforts, we can have the growth and development and save, uh, minimize the damage to species and key habitats. The other key issue that coming out of looking at this issue for three years was that NCCP agreements and our habitat conservation planning agreements are not the end all solution. That uh, day in and day out, counties are approving uh, make land use decisions. This raises this issue where we kind of have a functional, uh, you know, a real disjunct. In, in, in policy regarding species. The state agency has the primary responsibility over wildlife and wildlife resources, but counties actually have the authority to make the decisions on how we use the land. So frankly, uh, uh, they are very critical in this, yet I would, uh, I would urge you take a closer look at things like the conservation element in uh, county general plans that counties probably should be given a much greater responsibility in terms of conserving species, but they're not going to do it without technical assistance, without access to bond funds, and a number of other things. I don't have the solution there, but I think somehow we have to uh, really step up the role and responsibility of local governments in, in this program. Fish and Game is not going to be able to do this by themselves. Um, so that's my final, I mean, the only point I really want to make, again, I could have talked about 50 others, 
I will just say that the state wildlife plan that came out in 2005, it's, it's a, there's a hard copy, it's online, it's online in English and Spanish, uh, and that um, it is gone through the state, region by region, and it summarizes these issues. One, thing I, uh, one point I would like to make is that in all of these states' regions, hunting and fishing doesn't, come, it doesn't rank as a, a stressor among the other major stressors on fish and wildlife, nor does even poaching. Now, given there'll be some, ex probably a few exceptions where poaching is critical, but in all the states, if you sit down with, you know, both uh, nonprofit conservationists and county officials and experts in the field and the conservation, uh, none of them would rank fishing and hunting as one of the major issues causing decline in our species. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we're going to go now to Dick Cameron, who's a senior conservation planner for the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Chairman Huffman and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to present today uh, testimony on the behalf of the Nature Conservancy. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, projected climate change impacts on habitats and species in California. So as you can see from this chart documenting average annual temperature in California from 1895 to 2005, climate change is here. The observed climate change has been, has been happening. It's, it's not something that's looming in the future. We're in the middle of it. It's accelerating, and this chart shows that. At the current degree, two degree rise, uh, the impacts are both measurable and significant in terms of documented species movements, increase in growing season length, increase in fire frequency and severity, as well as sea level rise. You know, the way that we start to think about the future is in terms of emissions trajectories, the, the lines that go out into the future that represent the, the CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. So on the left, the, the worst case scenario, the business as usual scenario, if we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, up to a 90% loss of Sierra snowpack. In the interest of time, I'm gonna focus here on the more optimistic scenario. Uh, the governor's 2050 target, anywhere from still significant impacts, three to five and a half degree um, average temperature rise, as well as a 30 to 60% loss in Sierra snowpack. So even with a, the lowest emissions trajectory that we're talking about, there's still significant impacts. This gets into that a bit more with the, um, the box there on the right denoting the lower emissions target. In the blue, it might be hard to see in the back, but essentially what this is showing is the, the trajectory going out into the, the recent past. And the sad punchline of this slide is, is that current projections or mm. observed emissions from 2005 to 2008 are above the worst um, projection that the IPCC group modeled in terms of impact. So we're actually above the worst case rather than closer to the, the lower emissions, not to say that we can't bring those down in the future. So what will this feel like? What's the tangible sort of take home here? If you think about cities that you know, um, on the y-axis here on the verticals, annual rainfall, on the x-axis here is the average July maximum temperature, hot days. So under this lower emissions target, you know, we drop San Francisco closer to San Diego, Sacramento sitting there on top of Bakersfield, and then under the medium high emission scenario, Sacramento feels a lot, is even warmer than Bakersfield is today on those summer days. San Francisco more like San Diego, to put it in tangible terms. One thing that the Nature Conservancy is concerned about in, in working to model and represent the changing distribution of species. Here you can see from high above the Sierra Nevada crest looking north. In green, the current representation of the climate suitability for white fur. Going out to 2050, there's obviously a contraction in the suitable area for, for, red, for white fur. Um, and this is under the medium high emission scenario, retreating to higher elevation, cooler areas. Probability of fire, obviously something with huge implications for public safety as well as wildlife and, and fish species. On the left here, um, and I call your attention to the legend here, that's not percent change, but that's multiple. So this is, mm -hmm. even on the lower emission scenario, the probability of fire is around uh, you know, two times more probable mm -hmm. under the lower emission scenario. And on the right, the medium-high emission scenario, anywhere from three to four times the most of the forested part of the state. So overall, to summarize changes projected and expected and observed recently, um, increase in temperature, the amount of precipitation is somewhat indeterminate um, in terms of changes in models, but the, the type of precipitation is going to go more towards rain in the winter with a drop in snowpack. 
increase in fire frequency, and plants and animals have evolved in different uh, environmental contexts will likely shift to cooler areas or coastal areas, but in, in many ways they'll disassemble and create novel habitats. So the responses needed to this challenge, obviously an increase in adaptive management, tightening the link between land management and research, um, promoting connections between habitats so isolated parks and reserves don't become less resilient with climate change, um, use of best available science to meet management needs, and obviously an increase in interagency collaboration. The Nature Conservancy and others in California really is leading the way in this sense in terms of um, modeling impacts and developing responses. This is a, just a snapshot of how we're trying to figure out both the, the degree of agreement across models and the nature of the change projected for habitats in the state. Um, and obviously the response needs to be designed. It can't be ad hoc and it can't be late in the game. It needs to be proactive. And I commend the Department of Fish and Game obviously in their leadership in the California Climate Change Adaptation Strategy. This is just an example of how internally in the Nature Conservancy we're looking at uh, evaluating the effects and the response to climate change. And really the, the take home here is tightening the link between land management, observations on the ground, researchers in the field, as well as uh, models, to, you know, to try to make that link better. So finally, you know, the change will be so large that it's best to prepare now. We have much more leverage and opportunity to affect the change the sooner we start. Understanding when and where impacts are likely to be largest will obviously make intervention much more cost effective, and promoting adaptive management may be, uh, within institutions may be most important. Thank you. So um, th thank you um, very much, Dick. And it sounds like the, the take home from your uh, testimony is that uh, some degree of pretty dramatic change is sort of hardwired, uh, even under the best case scenario. And uh, of course, you're uh, urging us to plan ahead for it and to get moving on adaptation. Um, what's your assessment of uh, how the department is doing as our main I mean, they have led in a sense of designating a, a lead scientist and, and uh, incorporating the policy. Uh, you're a national organization. Uh, how would you say we're doing relative to the other states where TNC is trying to? Yeah, California is certainly things. showing leadership. You know, in the adaptation <coughs> strategy, Department of Fish and Game has shown quite a bit of leadership, obviously, in terms of that. Um, you know, as David Bunn pointed out, the challenges in limiting uh, planning. Obviously, planning is the most effective and efficient way to address this challenge um, initially, you know, in terms of characterizing impacts. And, you know, I, d I think the, the department, um, you know, is not unusual with other federal and state agencies in the sense that climate change is going to force agencies to break down barriers between them and uh, work more collaboratively. Okay. Well, last uh, on our panel, uh, certainly not least, we're going to hear from Chris Beal from the Resource Law Group. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Chair and members of the committee for giving me a chance to uh, talk, talk to you today. Um, a little bit about my background since you uh, may not know me. Um, in the 90s, I was a staff counsel for the Department of Fish and Game where I worked on endangered species issues. Uh, and for the past 10 years, I've worked in the uh, private sector on conservation planning for counties and uh, utilities and the occasional uh, private landowner. Uh, and what I'd like to do briefly is uh, expand on, on uh, something that uh, Mr. Bunn raised. We didn't uh, talk uh, before uh, the hearing today, but uh, we were focusing on a similar point. Um, and that is the um, department's uh, endangered species and conservation planning program, where I think there's really a compelling need uh, for, for some change and for some additional resources. And the reason I'm focusing on that program is, is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's the program the department has that focuses on the most sensitive species in the state, the, the most uh, most in need of protection. Uh, it is also um, uh, probably the strictest law that the Department of Fish and Game uh, uh, administers. It's a law that prevents, uh, prohibits the take of species without a permit issued by the department. And finally, it's a program uh, that billions of dollars worth of e economic activity has to go through. Uh, the Endangered Species Act touches on um, most major sectors of California economy from the from timber uh, to water, energy, land development as, as David pointed out, transportation projects. And yet it is a, a staff in a, in a program that's sort of envisioned as a permit review or project review program. Um, there are, uh, for all of these activities throughout the state, hundreds of applications, uh, approximately 25 people that focus on this activity. And uh, there is, I think, uh, uh, 
pretty broad consensus that the best way at a, at a, at a, um, at a broad scale to balance the competing needs of economic activity and species protection is to do regional conservation planning. And you see it happening all up and down the state. Um, uh, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan is a tremendous example, the Desert Renewable Ener Energy Conservation Plan, another key example, but there are also a number of uh, regional uh, land use based conservation plans uh, throughout the state ranging from uh, Placer County to San Diego County. Uh, and, these, uh, and these plans are extraordinarily complex. Uh, and so while it is true at some level the Department of Fish and Games Endangered Species programs are permit and project review programs, uh, that really grossly oversimplifies what's entailed in these planning processes. They're extremely uh, uh, detailed plans that take five to ten years at this point to, to, to develop. Um, and one of the things I've noticed over the past 15 years in working on these kinds of plans is how, f how often uh, the people that I'm working with are working on these plans for the very first time. Um, and uh, that's understandable if you're, say, a county. If you're developing a comprehensive 30-year land use plan, uh, you do that once, uh, and by the next time you have to do one of those plans, uh, the, the person who was there re retired. But it's also true at the Department of Fish and Game that there, uh, there um, is often the people assigned to these programs are relatively new, and that's, I think, because of two fundamental reasons. One is uh, that there are uh, relatively relatively few staff that are assigned to these programs. And the other is that there's a lot of turnover. As we've uh, heard other folks point out, because these positions are tied to the general fund and they go up and down, staff retention has been a problem. And, um, and I think fundamentally what, what I th the state needs, and I think this is true both from the perspective of protecting species, but also from the perspective of uh, uh, folks who are seeking permits for this program, is uh, that the department should be where the, the, the greatest expertise in conservation planning is housed. Uh, so that you're not staffing the program to review permits, you're staffing the program to provide the kind of planning expertise that counties need, that energy companies need, that uh, 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 water agencies need. Um, and that kind of expertise is not limited to biological expertise, that it can include land use planning expertise, uh, uh, economic expertise. These are the kinds of things that I think we really, really need to make a program work uh, at the broad scale that, it, that it's being implemented now. Um, so th that's another, I guess I'm joining the chorus, uh, advocating for a stable funding source, mm -hmm. uh, but also kind of a different vision for this program and, uh, and some support for the department uh, to help expand its level of expertise and its ability to, to make these plans work. Um, um, and uh, just, uh, I guess, one, one final point about that. Um, I know that uh, what it means to ask for an expansion uh, or uh, new funding um, in, in these times, but I think that um, one of the things that, that is really important to bear in mind is that we, you know, we have understandably today been focusing on the need for species protection and these conservation plans are, are in my opinion, I think in the many others, the best way to do that. But there's also an aspect of the conservation planning program that has uh, an economic effect. Um, there are hundreds of applications for renewable energy projects in the desert. I think there is uh, a broad opinion that having a comprehensive natural community conservation plan uh, is the right way to approve those projects in the long term, um, but uh, again, these processes take five to ten years and there's a lot that needs to be done both to prepare that plan and in the interim, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, it's, it's the same idea, um, and that same uh, priority is played out from county to county where um, a county may identify the need to develop a comprehensive plan because of extreme growth pressures. If you have a, a planning process that takes ten years to complete, that may mean that that uh, that cycle, that element of growth is actually happening at the time that you're doing the planning process. And so I think it really is important for a lot of reasons to, to be able to strengthen the ability to do these plans well uh, and do them quickly. Very good. Well, I want to thank everyone on the panel and we'll come back to the committee for uh, any questions. And it's just you and me, uh, Ms. Yamada. So. No, I defer to you. Well, very quickly, uh, you see the time being 12.15. Uh, I want to apologize in advance that I will not be here this afternoon uh, due to a rules committee hearing on another important matter <laughs> facing the state. And at least I know I think I'm still on rules as of this moment. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to thank uh, all the panelists again, uh, give a shout out to my UC Davis 
uh, compadres. I see Dr. Moyle has already left, but I know that we have a rich resource uh, right down the road from us. And uh, I wanted to put this out more as a general uh, statement that, you know, we are here in water parks and wildlife, but addressing many issues related to open space, land conservation, uh, how we can continue to support habitat and species. Are you all engaged in any conversations with the agricultural community? And I raise that because actually there was a very uh, a good and uh, timely article on the front page of the region section of Sacramento Bee today about the uh, loss of the Williamson Act subvention funds uh, as part of, uh, of a continued assault, frankly, on uh, probably one of the most successful um, land conservation programs in the country uh, and as that relates to habitat and protection of open space. Uh, and uh, someone mentioned, I believe it was um, you from UC Davis, about breaking down the barriers or, or was that from Nature Conservancy or both? Maybe it was thematic that um, breaking down the barriers between uh, various departments that have a similar interest. Um, are there any conversations going on with uh, you know, the agricultural community. I also serve on that committee. And, you know, as I've uh, lived through this past uh, year here in my first year in the legislature, although it feels like a dog year, more like seven, um, you know, I see all of you in this committee and then I go to the agricultural community and see all these other folks there and never the twain, it seems, shall meet uh, as frequently as I would like. So just kind of an open question to you. Uh, one thing that I would just reiterate, uh, Director McCammon mentioned was the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition, which I personally was involved with for a couple of years. Um, and I think that's a great example of both federal, you know, state, federal, and private interests. Obviously, there's a great interest in a lot of synergy between maintaining open rangelands for production of cattle and economic viability, as well as rural livelihoods and wildlife habitat. So that's something that I would certainly point to and see as a success. So would you say, just to follow on, that there will be additional advocacy amongst the environmental community to support uh, this discussion to restore the Williamson Act in California, or at least address some other, everybody wants a sustainable funding source, right? I mean, uh, for, for every possible system and service in California. But uh, will we see more of those partnerships? And I know about the Rangeland Trust because <coughs> actually when I was on Yolo County Board, that's how we got on as part of the list of supporters. I don't see Solano County on, which is my other county. So I'm gonna see if they can work on that. <laughs> Do you see additional, we, I mean, besides both Rangeland Both of my counties Trust. are on, for the record. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the Nature Conservancy certainly supports the Williamson Act as it's a critical act to maintain open space and rangelands and farmlands. Uh, and in terms of the, our lobbying efforts are pretty active on the CRCC at the federal level, particularly to open up um, private land stewardship funding as well. Ms. Caballero, any questions before we break for lunch? All right. Well, I want to thank this panel. It's been very interesting to hear uh, a set of very diverse perspectives on the, the question of how we're doing now that we've explored the department's mission and uh, begun to delve into uh, our effectiveness. So we will continue after lunch break at 1.30. Uh, it says 2, doesn't it? All right, we'll continue at 2 o'clock, uh, and we'll uh, continue to dive into how we can do better, and then we'll have a stakeholder uh, panel to finish up.